Let's get to work. Leah tried hacking into systems associated with places Kira had mentioned, while Steph, who had more magical experience but less tech-savviness, browsed news stories and other mundane pieces of information for anything that suggested it might be related to their situation. An hour later, they had turned up nothing. Leah sighed and sat, silent and frowning at the screen, as her mind turned over different ways of approaching the problem. Stephanie did likewise until something occurred to her. Could we try just, like, asking Pavla? She messaged us so you can reply to it, right? Leah blinked. Um, yes, good point. Forest for the trees, I suppose. She typed a brief response to the email from earlier, noting that if by some chance it was a trap, asking for extra information would put them into its jaws that much quicker. Still, she could not think of a better way to quickly gather more info that might be useful to Kira. After sending the request, she and Steph went back to work, accomplishing little in the seven minutes it took for Pavlo to reply. Damn, remarked Stephanie, she's as punctual as ever. Leah opened the message at once, then read it aloud. Okay, here's what she has to say. Our base of operations was a rundown church in the neighborhood where Kira, Stephanie, and I fought in that alley. Steph will remember. However, I do not know if they are still using the place. Often one location will be used first, then they will switch to another. Further, the Orthodoxy always establishes safe houses on the periphery of major cities. Check the outer suburbs and areas that are almost completely abandoned, but where seemingly useless properties have suddenly been purchased by obscure buyers. Often, a large house will be purchased in a neighborhood that has been cut off from other residential areas by industrial development. Especially note if a conversion from rubles to dollars is involved. Steph nodded. Makes sense, but not sure how much that narrows it down. People buy and sell random-ass properties around L.A. all the time. Leah nodded in grim agreement, then continued reading the screen. Next, she says... If a place seems likely, investigate it, but be careful. They will probably not have guards, since they are putting almost all of their personnel toward the war against the council. But they are always booby-trapped, both conventionally and with magic. Some of the traps are quite simple, like curses that activate when someone steps over the threshold of a door and things like that. But be wary. If you are uncertain, you might need to wait for Kira rather than try to penetrate them yourselves. Stephanie may be able to disarm some of the magic traps. Good luck. Both women sat back in their chairs, digesting the new information. Steph quipped. It's nice that I have her vote of confidence as far as dealing with the damned curses. However, I'm not on the same level as Kira yet, so I have to agree that we need to be sure what we're doing before we go barging in someplace. And first, we have to find one of these locations. Surprisingly, Leah's face had twisted into a smirk of amusement. What Pavla said is enough to get us started, she observed. And I gather these people do not think very highly of unmagical humans. Part of their power is based on the fact that most people don't know they exist and wouldn't believe it if they did know, and general secrecy, which allows them to operate without much scrutiny. I bet they've become sloppy over the years. Stephanie laughed. Could be. Leah went on. I think this might prove easier than Pavla suspects. The arrogant do not bother to close all the loopholes that should be closed. If I can say so, I'm exceedingly good at finding those who don't want to be found, or who think they're smarter than everyone else's. Azuto wandered to the window of his room, which looked down from the hotel's second floor at the parking lot. Their truck had arrived. Ah, good, he said to himself. I am growing tired of this place, and LeBlanc has me curious about what awaits us in New Orleans. It was a city he had never seen, granted, he had never been to the U.S. before, but had always wondered about it since it had an interesting and mysterious international reputation. But first, they had to get there. That meant a long, difficult, tortuous, and clandestine journey across more than a thousand miles of roads, spanning hills and cities, countryside and urban freeways. Last night, they had, with the partial aid of Mindy and Dan, decided on the best route to get them to Nola without arising too much suspicion. 
The direct route, which was more or less due southwest from their current location in West Virginia, was out of the question. A couple of members had briefly proposed that they instead drive due south along the Atlantic coast before bearing west toward Louisiana, but that too was discarded. The orthodoxy seemed to suspect they would head either for NOLA or the west coast, and fleeing south before they turned west would clue their enemies into their plans. Instead, they would drive directly west, not turning south until shortly before St. Louis. Then they would drive down to Memphis, assess the situation, and determine if a diversion or detour was needed before crossing Mississippi and finally reaching the Louisiana Bayou and the Blanc's hometown therein. They could faint westward if need be and then double back to their destination. Since James had not improved from his marginally functional state, transporting him would be the hardest part. Hence, the moving truck. Josiah Kane observed, speaking to no one in particular as Azuto went out into the hall. The sheer simplicity of the plan is its brilliance. A vehicle of this sort will accommodate a bedridden man far more easily than almost any other, Crystal Green commented. Yes, true, but we'll have to keep him secured. If we have to stop suddenly, he could roll out of bed and crash into the other cargo. Someone will have to be with him at all times, and we might have to use an illusion to hide him in case we're stopped by the police and we have to open the back. Mary Mitchell waved a hand. Yes, those are valid concerns, but we can deal with them. Samantha and Rufus claim they have come up with a rigging system for keeping James secure during the ride, though they said it will be irksome getting him in and out of each day and night. Hugh Buchanan gave a dry, snorting chuckle. Clever, but it seems excessive if you ask me. Back in my day, we were able to transport sick men on bales of hay loaded in the backs of horse-drawn wagons that had no seat belts. And yes, before you ask, those men survived. People were made of sterner stuff back then. The Blanc sighed. I remember those days. While there isn't anything wrong with a certain measure of sternness, our modern conveniences really are quite nice and useful. We will take advantage of as many as we require to get to New Orleans in one piece. By now, everyone had packed up the minimal belongings they had brought with them. Azuto only had a small suitcase's worth. Half of it was an extra set of clothes and some toiletries he'd carried from Samantha's house. And the rest consisted of vitamins, water, a first aid kit, and a small tool kit he had purchased this morning in town. As a group, they descended the stairs to the first floor of the charming but somewhat run-down old hotel. The clerk there stared at them with a vacant, relaxed expression, having been heavily enchanted the whole time they had lodged here. Azuto did not like the idea of using people as puppets, but all of them could well end up dead if even the slightest scrap of information about them were to make its way into the wrong hands. In any event, the man would be released from the spell once they were safely out of town. Mindy and Dan had been the ones to rent the truck and drive it back. Mary had given them the money for it since they both came from relatively humble backgrounds. The two of them jumped down from the vehicle as the council streamed out of the old building. Dan told them, This should be big enough, and we didn't notice anyone following us. Mindy added, Hope everything will go well. We did what you said, using false names and all that. You say we're invisible right now? I felt a little magic, but not as much as I would have thought for a spell like that. The Blanc smiled at them. And Azuto realized the young couple probably wasn't aware of the full magnitude of the council's power. Yes, said LeBlanc, this should serve us well. And no one more than two hundred feet away can see us. We also have our magical signatures well dampened against tracking. If the orthodoxy, particularly their stronger members, was focusing directly on our location. It wouldn't pass muster. But a casual scan of the region will not find us. And, of course, we are leaving now. Please keep low profile yourselves. We would not want you to suffer any reprisals for having aided us. Amanda approached Mindy and Dan and handed them a pair of small objects. Charms, she explained, made by Zakaria. She was talented at them. They'll protect you from both surveillance and attack. We can't thank you enough. Everyone else joined in, giving the two witches their gratitude or shaking their hands. 
Not only had they procured the truck, but they had also used informal lines of communication with non-magical people in the state to ensure that no one would mention having seen a large party of weird people moving westward if anyone asked. There was one question remaining, though, which was whether the party should split up or ride together. In addition to the large moving truck, they had also purchased a sedan and a van from the local dealership. A couple of suggestion spells had expedited the paperwork. As the discussion resumed in earnest, Azuda watched in dismay. Four members, Amanda, Rufus, Josiah, and James during a moment of lucidity, had voted for splitting up. The rest favored staying together, but their majority was not large enough to overrule the objectors. Azuto felt he finally had something to offer. Excuse me, he interjected, but if I may, in my past experiences, it was always better to keep a group together. Yes, a larger party moves more slowly and requires coordination, and if you are discovered by hostile people, there is no backup, no other group that can carry on without you. But those disadvantages are smaller than the one great advantage— which is that there is no possibility of one group getting lost and having to waste great amounts of time trying to meet back up. James was sleeping again, but the rest thought it over. Amanda shrugged. So be it. I hereby change my vote to staying together. If we're ambushed, now that I think about it, having all our people in one place will make us harder to defeat. Grudgingly, Rufus and Josiah acceded to the majority. Azuto closed his eyes. Not only was sticking together the wiser option, but he was impatient to get moving rather than linger and argue. The orthodoxy was drawing closer with every minute wasted, Mary announced. All right, once James is secure, we can leave. How is that coming? Since they had designed the rig, Samantha and Rufus had taken it upon themselves to cart James, who was lying on a stretcher they had borrowed from the fire station, into the truck and begin the process of securing him. Five minutes, Samantha called. Ten, Rufus corrected her. Or seven, at least. Hugh chortled. In my day, we could do it in four. Chapter 17 Milena tried not to sneeze as her nose began bleeding again. Sneezing would only make things worse. She breathed in through her mouth, cleared her mind, and cast a light healing spell on herself, focused on her sinus cavity. The bleeding stopped, but she immediately became lightheaded from the magical expenditure involved, which interacted badly with her head injury. She raged as her small hands curled into fists. I am going to fucking kill that bitch! Daniela, who had been quieter and more sheepish than usual since last night, looked up. Well, that was always the plan, was it not? Hannah added, I am surprised you said that in English, Milena. Someone might overhear. Be quiet, Milena snapped in Russian. We blanked the memories of everyone in this car. For all they know, I could be cursing at something in a video game. Now, go get me another cocktail. I keep having to heal my nose, so I can't risk wasting my healing spells on my tailbone. Ugh, how could this have happened? If she did not have an example to maintain in front of the lower-ranking witches, she might have cried. It wasn't only the pain. It was the embarrassment. Hannah and Daniela had both seen the American witch disarm her, beat the shit out of her, and dismissively kick her to the floor. Once again, they had overestimated their target. They had assumed she would stick to the use of magic rather than resort to the ultimate crudity of brute force. If it weren't for their orders to capture the young woman alive and then sacrifice her, Milena would have been happy to let Daniela beat her to death as a form of poetic justice. Hannah did as she was told sliding off her bunk to head to the dining car and fetch another beverage for her superior. While waiting for her to return, Milena reflected on the amount of extra work they'd all had to do, scrambling to control the repercussions caused by their debacle of a sweep. The memory wipes were only part of it. They'd also had to cast persuasion spells on the security guard, who was also suspicious as to why he had suddenly passed out in the middle of a conversation with Milena, the conductor, a couple of the engineers and handymen, and one of the cooks. They had needed to keep other people behind screens of illusions while they rushed to repair the parts of the train that had been damaged in the fight. And all the while, Milena was working with a flattened nose and a bruised and possibly cracked tailbone. 
Healing spells had controlled it somewhat. But when the job was over, she would probably need mundane surgery to look normal again. Focus, she told herself. Focus on the importance of the job. That girl is a fool, a sentimental idiot. She's stronger and more wily than we expected, yes, but she has an obvious weak spot in that. She could have killed me. She certainly should have. If that is how she wants to play, then we will fucking play. When I have her on the sacrificial table, she will not be the beneficiary of my usual clean and efficient technique. No, I will accidentally make a mistake or two and draw out the process of her death longer than strictly necessary. Such a pity when that happens. She did not enjoy killing people. Enjoyment was not what she sought, but she would not tolerate insult and embarrassment. The girl had to pay. After Hannah returned with her cocktail, and she drunk it, mellowing as the alcohol took effect, a new plan began to form. They had brainstormed a few different things that morning in their brief stretches of downtime between cleaning up the general mess. But the problem of how to capture and kill their quarry was becoming intractable. Another direct assault presented too many risks. Waiting till the end of the train ride pushed them far too close to Inezga's deadline. They had already wasted one of the two days allotted to them. They needed a way to put the American witch at a disadvantage and draw her into an unfair fight without time to prepare. Ideally, it should happen elsewhere than on this wretched train. Milena's mind settled on a solution. It presented risks and what some people referred to as ethical concerns, but it was unlikely to fail. Success in her profession was ultimately the only thing that mattered. Stand by, Milena told her cohorts. I have arrived at the beginnings of a plan. I must think longer still, though, about how to implement it. Once I have a better idea, I will solicit your input. Soon. Hannah stared at her with the calm, clear look she often used to acknowledge that she had heard something but could think of nothing to say in response. Daniela gave her a nod and settled back into sullen, cantankerous boredom. Ignoring both women for the time being, Milena's mind worked on the problem that loomed before them. The logistics and timing would have to be perfect. They would need to execute the operation at precisely the right hour and minute in conjunction with both a lull in their enemy's likely activity and an appropriate stop on the train's route so that a quick egress would be a simple matter. There was also the issue of finding a suitable subject. For that, Hannah could be useful, given her talent for mentally scanning not only for magic, but also for the personality auras of regular people who did not possess the gift. Finally, Daniela would likely be the best one to carry out the selection. She was capable of responding with crude physical force if need be, and Milena and Hannah could easily cover her tracks. Milena said to herself, It can be done. She checked the train's itinerary on the railroad company's website. By now, they were well into the Great Plains, more than halfway across the United States and close to the Rocky Mountains. With fewer stops in the less populous regions of the interior west, they would make speedy progress toward their ultimate destination of Los Angeles. But before they arrived in the City of Angels, there was to be another stop in Riverside. That wasn't far from a certain location the orthodoxy had secured, one Milena had been involved in briefing the lower-ranking members about, in fact. The train would be pausing at the station there in the early hours of the morning before dawn. Perfect. Milena breathed in and out, relaxing and thinking about the inevitable success to come. She finally looked at her subordinates. Hannah, Daniela, fate will be kind to us. Late at night before the sun rises, we will spring the trap. This will coincide with our arrival in Riverside, California, near our safe house. The two other witches perked up. Milena continued. Let us now discuss the details. Leah's posture abruptly straightened, her body growing tense and her eyes gleaming with excitement. All right, we have a location. Stephanie looked at her. Oh, damn. Where? She had been taking a short break. A bowl of half-eaten yogurt and a cup of half-drunk tea rested on her portion of the desk, while her phone stared at the ceiling.
unattended, but not yet asleep. Before she responded, Leah closed her eyes and inhaled through her nose. It's in Jerupa Valley, over by Riverside, a bit of a drive, but doable. Less than an hour if traffic isn't god-awful. We can make a day trip out of it, but— She frowned. Pavlo warned us that these places aren't generally left just sitting there. We'll have to contend with their defenses. Already plotting how to approach it, Steph suggested, Email Pavla again and tell her we're going in. What do we need to know? She can probably give us a rundown of what their defenses will be like. Leah's vague scowl implied that she wasn't too keen on the idea of barging in on the place, but she nonetheless typed a message and sent it. Meanwhile, Stephanie fished around in her bag for her bootleg copy of How to Be a Badass Witch and began reviewing spells and charms that might help her. As they waited, Leah turned to her friend. I mailed Pavla, but frankly, I think it might be better for us to wait for Kira and Chris to get back before we rush into anything. That way, we will approach the situation while we're at full organizational strength. As a unit. Steph countered as her eyes skimmed the spells for physical self-augmentation and improved luck. We're not going to assault the place and take on the whole orthodoxy. It's only a scouting mission. You and me make a pretty good unit. I figure you can stay here and keep doing research and stay in touch while I go scope the place out. That way, Kira will know what's up when she gets back. Though she still didn't seem thrilled about the idea, Leah agreed. Five minutes later, they heard back from Pavla. Oh, this doesn't sound good, Leah sighed. Magical traps are especially common, and they seem to prefer subtle ones that impair a person from being able to snoop more, not to mention scare them away without causing obvious damage. Those are combined with mundane booby traps that can injure or kill a person while being made to look like an accident. That sounds like a bad combination. Yeah, Steph had to concede. But it also sounds like they're mainly concerned about normal, non-magical folks stumbling in. I've got an edge against all that. Leah pointed out that Pavla's message went into more detail and printed it for Stephanie to take with her and review before she went in. Then she gave her the address, and they shared a quick hug. Be careful, said Leah. I don't want anything to happen to you. Not to mention, Kira would kill me. Steph separated from her and stood up. True that. I'll check in every few minutes once I'm there. She brought a small dashboard camera with her, intending to turn it on to stream what happened upon arrival back to Leah. She left the warehouse, got into her car, and hit the road. Traffic wasn't too bad, so she figured she could make it to her destination in 50 to 55 minutes. Compared to L.A. or Long Beach, Jerupa Valley was a small town, though it had to some extent amalgamated with the generalized suburban sprawl that stretched across Southern California from Redlands and Moreno Valley in the Inland Empire to Thousand Oaks and San Clemente on the Pacific Coast. Nonetheless, the address Leah had provided lay in a less populated area, close to the freeway but set away from other houses and businesses. It was a medium-sized, two-story house, probably built in the 1970s or 80s, it was surrounded on three sides by a seven-foot fence and had a mostly bare front yard of dust and gravel. Lots of privacy. It looked deserted. Stephanie pulled her car up and parked on the side of the road, far enough away from the house that she could claim to be going somewhere else or scoping out the neighborhood real estate if she had to, but close enough that it wouldn't be a long sprint back to the vehicle if there was trouble. Okay, she murmured, and did a brief reread of the printed suggestions from Pavla. Apparently, the orthodoxy liked to set up falling object traps that would either injure or kill an intruder or drive them unwittingly into other magical snares that would badly frighten or disorient them. The idea, the check explained, was to get rid of anyone who happened by without being too dramatic about it so as to avoid scrutiny from the neighbors or normal authorities. Nodding, Stephanie cast two spells on herself— one to amplify her perception, reflexes, strength, and speed, and the other to increase her overall luck so chancy and ambiguous situations were more likely to tip in her favor. For good measure, she spent a moment meditating and expanding her mind to gain better insight into where the magical traps might be located. There was no more time to delay. Steph climbed out of the car and walked toward the house. No one seemed to be around. As she strode across the desolate lot, 
Her expanded senses picked a whiff of magic within the structure. It was impossible yet to discern what curses might lurk within or where they were, however. She inhaled. Here goes nothing. When she mounted the porch, nothing happened, so she put her hand on the front door and tried the knob. It wasn't locked. She turned it all the way, pushed the door open, and stepped inside. There was a small foyer area adjacent to a living room where a couple of pieces of furniture lay draped in dirty sheets. Everything was covered in dust. To her right, a staircase rose toward the second floor. While advancing toward the stairs, Stephanie looked up. A large, heavy bucket perched on a stray beam along the ceiling was tottering. Shit, she exclaimed and dived forward as the bucket fell. With her reflexes sped up, she avoided it handily. The bucket was filled with dry cement and hit the floor with a deafening crack, damaging the floorboards and kicking up clouds of gray particles. As Steph moved away from it, she sensed the growing presence of hostile magic right behind her. Spinning, she saw nothing, but her mind was attacked by unreasoning fear. It's probably a spell to scare me into doing something stupid, she surmised. There's nothing here. Well, actually, there are things here, but it's all trickery and bullshit. Trying to ignore the inclination toward blind panic, she mounted the staircase. The fourth step collapsed under her feet. She had half expected something like that to happen and jumped upward, riding the half of the board that flipped upward before hopping onto the first landing. Then the second hex, which had been cloaked and obscured by the fear curse, triggered. Stephanie gasped as a cascade of bright purplish-pink flashing lights erupted in front of her face. Just a color spray spell? It's harmless. It was probably trying to get me to blunder into whatever trap they have on the next set of stairs. But as she turned around, carefully moving toward the steps, the lights didn't go away. Like fat magenta raindrops striking a sidewalk, they kept bursting in front of her face. Something was wrong. The feeling of dread was back, now combined with an overpowering sense of being watched. The orthodoxy's defenses were thicker and nastier than she had expected. There might be an alarm somewhere, too, which would tip them off that one of their sanctuaries had been invaded and cause them to defend the place with even worse things. Fine. Time to abort the mission. It pained her, but Steph realized she couldn't scour the whole house without either backup or more planning and preparation. She jumped over the hole in the staircase, landed on the first floor, and was back out the front door in seconds. As she slammed it behind her, her heart sank. The trap spell, which had at first seemed to merely be an evocation of unnatural colors in the outside world, was in truth a curse laid upon her own senses. Oh, Steph moaned, putting a hand to her face and rubbing her eyes. The bright magenta spots continued to bloom and blossom across her field of vision. They did not flag or fade. She saw them whether her eyes were open or shut. Damn it. Damn, damn, damn. This is going to make it hard to drive and just about impossible to sleep. Glancing around and ignoring the spots to the best of her ability, she determined that no one was pursuing her and no unfriendly vehicles were approaching. She jogged back to her car, started the engine, and pulled onto the road. Things went well enough at first, the maroon bubbles were distracting, but by moving her head in one direction or the other, she could still see enough of what was in front of her to drive. But in time, it would drive her crazy. Her mind raced, then wondered. I wonder if they had hidden cameras at that place, or some other magic trap, like a scrying spell or whatnot, that let them see what my car looked like and got a good look at my license plate. If that's the case, I might have to trade this thing in soon. It's getting old anyway. Halfway back to Long Beach, after she had crossed the hills and was nearly to Anaheim, Stephanie found herself growing nauseated. The incessant movement of the blooming spots was giving her an unusual low-level motion sickness, and the winding road around the middle of the route and the extra elevation changes had made it worse. Grudgingly, she pulled into a gas station. She could stand to refill her tank, but mostly it was simply an opportunity to stop and rest and recover. Standing still and pumping gas helped, but the spots weren't going away. Steph went to the bathroom in the gas station, where she took advantage of the extra privacy to dial Leah's number, hoping she would pick up quickly. 
Come on, girl, she muttered, tapping her foot. The phone clicked on the third ring. Hello? Leah's voice asked. Stephanie, are you okay? Kinda, she replied. I got out in one piece, only, um, how do I put this? I think I'm sick. Feeling a little weird, and it's hard to see. I can explain more later, but, um, let's say I picked up a bug while I was out there. I'm gonna need some treatment for it. Don't think it's contagious, though. Leah was quiet for a few seconds. Okay, can you make it back here? I can come get you if you need me. Yeah, I think I'll manage. I found out some good stuff, though. Plenty to tell Kira. She'll have to be the one to deal with it in the end, I'm sure. Steph expanded her consciousness to scan for anyone in or near the restroom who might be listening to her conversation. No one seemed to be. Then again, her abilities along those lines were not as developed as Kira's were. Leah responded, That's great, but we'll need to, uh, get you healthy again, too. Hurry back and call me again if you have any problems. I'll be here, over and out. Bye, Steph said, and hung up. Before returning to her car, she splashed cold water on her face. It seemed to help a little. The neon bursts of color continued to torment her, but her other senses calmed and adapted to a small degree. On the rest of the drive back to Leah's place, between dodging people driving like morons and navigating the general congestion, Stephanie wrestled with the fact that they were going to have to tell Kira everything. She wouldn't be happy. Mm-hmm, Steph grumbled to herself. She's going to be all like, Stephanie, why did you take that risk? You could have been killed, should have waited for me to get back, blah, blah, blah. Like, I don't have the same powers she does. Well, technically I don't, or at least not to the same degree, but I'm still one of the few people who can do magic. It's not as though I'm helpless. Soon she was back in Long Beach. As she pulled her car into the driveway, Leah came out the front door of her house and watched her probably hoping to gain a modicum of advanced knowledge as to what her mysterious affliction was. When Steph climbed out, Leah said, Well, I'm glad to see that nothing is visibly wrong with you. Come inside and tell me about it. Right. That's the plan. Stephanie rubbed her eyes again. There was no change in the intensity of the hex. The magenta spots tormented her every bit as viciously as they had an hour ago. But let's agree on one thing until further notice. They strode inside, and as Leah closed the door, she cocked an eyebrow and asked, What? Steph grimaced. Kira doesn't need to find out how we know about all the damn booby traps. We can just say a little bird told us. Leah poured a cup of coffee for each of them. It's worth a try, though I imagine it will be a futile effort to get her to believe that. I know, Steph admitted but she'll take the bad news better after she's distracted by dealing with all that shit herself. We can slip it in then. Leah laughed. Good idea. Chapter 18 It was dark, and the train slept. Everyone except the security guard, who was still ruffled and confounded over what had happened the other night when he had lost consciousness for no apparent reason, slumbered in peace. They were oblivious to the plan about to be carried out by three of the passengers. Milena glanced out the window of their compartment. They were traveling through northwestern Arizona and would be in Southern California presently, but there was time to carry out the operation, provided nothing went disastrously wrong. And if something did go that badly, then they might have to crash the train to cover their tracks. There were always options. There was always a way to turn a situation to one's own advantage and snatch victory from the proverbial jaws of defeat. The mesas on the plateau outside loomed like black monoliths against the barren yet majestic landscape, which was faintly illuminated by the glow of the moon and stars. The sky was a deep, dark blue speckled with bright nodes of silver. She looked at Hannah and Daniela, who were standing at attention. They were ready to move out. Milena raised a finger. Before we begin, let us review your orders and our overall priorities of goals. It is highly unlikely that the American witch will anticipate what we have in mind, or have any way of stopping it, unless she has somehow been able to scry us, which is all but impossible. Nonetheless, recall what we are to do if the plan fails. Hannah spoke first. Cloak ourselves, befuddle the passengers, leave the train, and float to safety— her face was placid with the numbness of calculation. Then, 
Daniela finished with a cruel twist of the mouth. We seal them, blow up the engine, and push the train off the tracks. Why don't we just do that anyway? It would make things simpler. Milena frowned at her. In the short term, yes. In the longer term, no, since we would have a great many deaths to account for. And a disaster on this level would be investigated thoroughly by the authorities. Oh, our tracks would be covered, but it would create unnecessary hassles. It is better to kill only the minimum number of people necessary to accomplish the goal. Not to mention, we would have to quickly find a replacement sacrifice. While Daniela scowled and grudgingly resigned herself to obedience and moderation, Milena's thoughts turned back to the ultimatum given to her by the Grand Mistress. They were running out of time. The Orthodoxy needed the empowerment Milena's talents could grant by the middle of the coming day. Otherwise, their war against the Council would drag out longer and might even face the prospect of actual failure. Anezga would be greatly displeased. The trio spent two minutes reviewing all the steps in their plan A, then placed their hands on one another's shoulders and got to work. The first thing they needed to do could be done from the privacy of their cabin, which would make the night's labors far easier. The three witches linked minds and began sharing power amongst them, forming a circuit into which the divine powers of the universe flowed at their summons. Hannah had been maintaining a potent but relatively untaxing enchantment that dissipated their auras into a vague, misty presence, making them imperceptible to anyone but the strongest of witches, and all but impossible to trace to a single individual except for those of extreme skill and long experience. Now they weaponized it. The magical cloud enveloped the whole train, growing denser and darker as more energy was channeled into it. It seeped into every crack and hovered around the face of every sleeping passenger. Sleep, Milena said, sleep until we arrive in Riverside. Sleep as though you had never slept in your life and were so tired that this alone was your chance to rest, a chance not to be missed, precious beyond all else to you. Sleep deeply, unable to be disturbed by sound, by motion, by touch, by smell, or by any sixth sense warning of danger. The mist curled through the passengers' nostrils, mouths, and ears, and worked its way into their brains. Their unconsciousness deepened to resemble a coma more than sleep. There was only one point of resistance, and the three witches had no need to guess who it was. Their foe, their rival, their soon-to-be sacrifice. The spell was not working against her as well as it should have, but Milena had expected as much. More power, she intoned, and the trio channeled extra energy and influence into their enchantment. The slight sense of alarm that had begun to rise from the girl's aura dampened, though, alas, still not into catatonia. Melina had considered that if the spell did incapacitate the girl as well as everyone else, they could try kidnapping her. However, that created enormous opportunities for risk if the magic failed in even the slightest fashion. She had been right in deciding they should take an indirect approach. The enchantment reached its end. The American sorceress was sleeping, albeit not as deeply as the others. Milena had no intention of getting close enough to wake her up, regardless. She stated, Let us move out. They lowered their hands, maintaining a partial mental link but ending the full conduit that allowed them to cast spells as a group. It would be a journey down the train. The child they sought was in the first passenger car past the foyer compartment and slightly past the train's halfway point toward the rear. Daniela led the way, ready to use brute force if necessary. Hannah was in back, continuously scanning and focusing on enchantments, Milena stayed between them so she could direct either of them as required or help with whatever needed doing. Aside from the continuous white noise of the train, everything was as silent as a crypt. Even the conductor slept, though the train would be fine without his guidance for a little while. It was in the second-to-last compartment before the dining car that they happened upon the security guard. He had been walking a slow patrol when the sleep spell had hit and lay slumped in the hall twisted against the wall. Milena had Daniela pick him up and haul him along with them, depositing him on a chair in the dining car so he could instead sleep in a sitting position with his head on the table. 
The trio moved, shortly reaching the car they sought. Daniela and Hannah stood on either side of the door, leading into the sleeping compartment, while Milena peered at it, twisted her hands and whispered a few sharp words. The door opened of its own accord. It didn't make much sound, but even if the family within had heard, they gave no indication. All three of them slept like the dead. The father slept by himself on one bunk, while the mother and daughter slept together on another. Milena stood aside and gestured. Daniela stepped in, hesitated a second, and then grabbed the little girl around the waist, pulling her free from the sleeping woman. The child didn't stir. She was about six years old, Milena estimated. Daniela put the girl over her shoulder and then returned to the hallway. Milena replaced the covers around the mother, making it appear as though nothing had happened and the girl had never been there. Then she stepped out, closed the door, and went past her companions to the juncture of the current car and the next one toward the back. So, my friend, she thought, fixing her mind on what she could recall of the American witch's aura and allowing her anger to percolate. Since you are more talented than we gave you credit for, you will surely have no difficulty receiving this message when the time is right, will you? No, none whatsoever. Hannah and Daniela waited as their leader cast the spell. A delayed action psychic missive witch, once the rival witch passed by, would introduce itself into her mind with too much force and clarity to resist. However, it would not seem like a message specifically intended for her. It would have the appearance of a psychic echo, like a haunting, which their target would just so happen to perceive as evidence. It would make it clear that because of her, Milena and her cohorts had no choice but to kidnap the child and sacrifice her in the American witch's stead. Then, they would go to their safe house in Jerupa Valley to perform the ritual. And the American witch, who seemed to be a fearless and proactive sort of person, would charge to the rescue, at which point it would be over. On friendly turf, the Orthodoxy's agents would have a massive advantage, and the sacrifice could at last be completed. Waving her hand to finish the spell, Milena turned and gestured for her subordinates to return to the foyer car. Once everyone was gathered there, Milena took over holding the unconscious child while Daniela gathered their bags from the room and brought them out. This way, the instant the train arrived in Riverside, the three of them could stroll out and be gone while everyone else on the vehicle was still rousing themselves from their magically enhanced slumber. Milena smiled. Excellent work, she said as much to herself as to the others. She looked at the little girl in her arms, who was pretty and harmless looking. The child seemed to have an ever so faint touch of the gift of magic. Interesting, Milena commented. If by some chance the American does not come after us, all is not lost. Catherine Tremell awoke slowly, emerging from the fog of sleep with more difficulty than she would have expected. It was as though she had chased a half bottle of booze with two or three sleeping pills and then, in the depths of her dreaming, forgotten where she was or how long it had been since the last time she was awake. She groaned and yawned and stretched. Her vision was a blur, and the sounds of the train around her, an insensate mass of noises. It took three or four seconds before she had the slightest idea of what was going on. She was on the train to Los Angeles with her husband Aaron and their daughter Jessica, and Jessica had been sleeping next to her. Catherine lowered her hands. The girl was nowhere to be seen. She came alert, her senses sharpening all at once, and sat upright in the bed, kicking off the covers and scanning the room. Aaron was still lying in his bunk but was beginning to stir. She grabbed his shoulder and shook him. Where's Jessica? She's not in here. Aaron mumbled and opened his eyes. For him, too, it took a moment to regain full consciousness, though perhaps due to the urgency in his wife's voice, he came back more quickly than she had. I don't know. He started to crawl out of bed, obviously concerned but struggling to regain functionality. I was asleep. Did she go out to the bathroom? Dining car? Frowning, Catherine got out of bed and went to the door, still in her light pajama top and shorts, and opened it. 
I'll go check the dining car and up front. You wait here to see if she comes back from the other direction. It looked like he was going to insist that he go instead, but she didn't delay another second. She was out the door and down the hall by the time he reached the threshold. Jessica, she called. Jessica, it's your mother. Are you in the bathroom? Their compartment had a tiny communal lavatory in the center of the car. Hearing no response, Catherine knocked on the door. Then she opened it, saw no one inside, and hastened toward the dining car. As she stumbled down the hallway, it was clear that the train had come to a stop at what had to be one of the last stations before L.A. A handful of passengers was milling about, all of them looking as zombified as she had felt before, worry and adrenaline had kicked in to perk her up. Catherine saw no one in the foyer aside from an engineer who was resting on a bench and seeming to only now be waking up. She went past him into the dining car. Jessica! She got to a good vantage point for viewing the entire compartment and scanned it. There were four other passengers standing there, looking confused about what they were doing. The security guard was dragging himself out of a chair at one of the little dining tables. A cook was rubbing his eyes and apologizing for being behind schedule. He didn't seem to understand what had happened. Last he recalled, he was wide awake. No one else was present. No, oh, Aaron, make sure you stay put, she muttered under her breath, worried that he might tramp toward the rear of the car and miss the girl, and she would get lost trying to find the right cabin on her way back. Catherine proceeded to the front half of the train. Two minutes later, she had poked through every car and reached the conductor's seat at the front. She did not see Jessica and no one else claimed to have seen her either. A sick, desperate sensation of panic was rising through her stomach and into her chest, making her heart thump and her lungs heave. We're on a train. There aren't many places she could have gone. They haven't even opened the doors yet. Have they? Are the emergency exits child-proofed? That did not even bear thinking about, and she tried not to sob. Back in the dining car, she flagged down the security guard and told him what had happened, describing what Jessica looked like for good measure. I'll tell them to keep the doors closed until we find her, the man replied, hoisting his communication device. Looking past him, Catherine saw that her husband had come into the dining car. She's not anywhere in the back half of the train, he reported. You didn't find her? Catherine's hands were shaking, and it took all of her strength not to scream, wail, or pound on the walls. No, she growled. Chapter 19 Kira froze, not caring that she was blocking Chris in the door between cars. Hey, he asked, his voice somewhere behind her. Is everything okay? She didn't hear him. Less out of conscious choice and more out of a primitive instinct to lean on something, she stumbled forward and to the side and pressed her shoulder against the compartment wall, allowing it to support her as the awful vision that had detonated in her mind played out. The witches from the front of the train, under the cover of darkness and perhaps using spells to keep everyone else pacified, they had invaded the room of a family on this car, snatched a little girl right out of her mother's arms and took her away. After the three women departed the room, it was hard to see what they had done next. But Kira could feel and hear the gist of their intentions, to steal off the train before anyone else was up or realized the girl was missing. They wanted to get far away with their captive and would cloak their progress with magic. However, a phrase seemed to bubble up out of the witch's mental residues, and Kira was almost positive it was their destination. Darupa Valley. Kira, Chris said, coming up beside her as another passenger came through behind him and squeezed past. What's wrong? Talk to me, will you? She shuddered and blinked, and the vision was gone. Cold revulsion spread through her bloodstream, but anger followed it. Her eyes snapped upward as another car or two down. She heard a woman sobbing and a man shouting something. It wasn't hard to guess who was making the racket. Chris, Kira told her boyfriend without looking at him. Get our stuff. We need to get off at the stop and start doing detective stuff right away. Trust me on this. I'm going to go talk to that couple. Meet me up there in a minute when you have our things, okay? I'll explain everything later. She turned to look at him. His face was contorted with a mixture of worry, confusion, 
annoyance and legitimate appreciation for how serious she had become. He knew full well that she could see and hear things he could not, so he wasn't phased when she said something strange out of the blue. Okay, he replied in a soft voice. Just promise me that whatever we need to do, we're going to be smart about it. She gave him a kiss on the cheek. I promise. Then she darted toward the crying woman. Kira found a couple in their early or mid-thirties standing in the corner of the foyer car with various train officials standing around them. The conductor and one of the other engineers, as well as the security guard and one of the cooks. The woman was on the verge of hysteria, red-faced and teary-eyed. The man wasn't much better. He struggled to stay calm and oscillated between shouting in frustrated anger and wanting to join his wife in sobbing in despair. What do you mean, he demanded, his voice cracking. All the passengers aren't accounted for yet. Are you trying to tell us that someone could have slipped off the train with our daughter before anyone even knew we had stopped? What the hell kind of shit is going on with this rail line? The assistant engineer put a hand over his eyes, muttering to himself, this has been the worst trip I've ever seen, that's for damn sure. The security guard tried to reassure the couple that he had made all the necessary phone calls. The railroad authorities had locked down the station and were sweeping the place and checking their security cameras. They were already in touch with the police, who would be putting out an amber alert as soon as they had a little more information. Kira waited until the train's employees began to drift away before she approached the couple. Excuse me. The man raised a hand toward her without looking. Not now. Pardon me, she went on, but I'm a detective. You know, a private investigator. Yes, I know I look young, but I have several cases under my belt. I heard what happened, and I might be able to help find your daughter. The man and the woman stopped their slow pacing and pivoted to look at her. She could see the intense pain and fear in their eyes, and her heart almost broke. Okay, the man responded. Credentials? Kira produced her business card, glad she had brought some in her wallet. The man looked it over, then pulled out his phone. Don't mind if I check to see if you're legit. No offense. Kira shrugged. That's fine. Can you tell me more about what happened, what your daughter looks like? The woman appeared to be Latina, and the man was Caucasian with dark hair, so she doubted the girl was a blonde or a redhead. Otherwise, Kira had not been able to glean anything about the child from what she had overheard. Details about the girl's appearance had been fuzzy in her vision as well. The woman was getting her crying under control. My name is Catherine, and this is my husband, Aaron Trammell, she stated. Our daughter's name is Jessica. She's six years old with straight, dark brown hair a little past her shoulders. She was wearing a pink sweater. She looks more like her father than like me. She... Oh, God! Kira hesitantly put a hand on the woman's shoulder as she broke down again, and waited for her to get herself back together. The father, Aaron, glared at her briefly, but then his expression softened. Looking up from his phone, he declared, All right, looks like you're a real company, though I'm not seeing much information about past cases you've been involved in. We can't afford to give you a down payment, but if you can bring our little girl back to us, then name your price. We'll figure out a way to pay it. Kira was suddenly embarrassed, even ashamed. She was anxious to get out and begin searching for the child. Mentioning that she was a detective had simply been a way to expedite the process and gain the couple's trust, and she hadn't thought about money. Um, she began, don't worry about it for now. I just want to help. I have people who work under me also. In fact, she turned her head as Chris came into the foyer car, lugging their crap. Here's my IT guy now. Hi, Chris. These are the Tremels, and I think they've hired us. Aaron grunted. Yes, we have. Now get out and find her. I'll keep your business card and give you a call as soon as I hear from the stuffed shirts around the station about the make and model of the culprit's getaway vehicle, or anything like that. Catherine added, Thank you. Please, anything you can do. I'm on it. Kira nodded at them, hoping her eyes conveyed that she meant it. Rushing to Chris's side, she grabbed her half of the luggage. Okay, we need to get a move on. I have an idea where to start. They stepped out of the train and onto the platform noting that guards and cops were milling around and looking everyone over. Chris coughed. Okay, great. Start what? I missed the part where someone explained to me what the hell is going on. A police officer walked toward them. 
Kira inhaled and rapidly concocted a spell to dismiss suspicion from her and her boyfriend, casting it just as the man stood in front of them. Hi, officer, she said. We already spoke to the parents. We heard what happened. As you can see, we don't have the girl with us, and if you want to know anything else, talk to them. Catherine and Aaron Trammell. The spell clearly worked since the cop just raised an eyebrow, said, Oh, okay, good, and walked away. Kira exhaled in relief as they went on their way. Chris pointed out, If they talk to the parents, they'll know we were hired for this job, whatever it is. Actually, uh, you referred to them as the parents and mentioned the girl. Don't tell me those witches snatched a kid off the train. If you insist, Kira murmured, then I won't tell you that was exactly what they did. Chris groaned as they left the platform and went to the terminal, which held desks and booths for renting cars. Oh, that's fucking lovely. Well, it's good that we're on the case since the cops aren't going to be able to track people who can hide their passage with magic. Still, this wasn't how I wanted the tail end of our vacation to go. So, then, what's this piece of information you have about where to start? Drew up a valley. Kira chose a car rental company and headed toward their booth. Not far. It was in a vision I saw, kind of like when the duo, those thaumaturges from the council, the ones who are probably behind the book, left me that message about how they wanted to train me, or else, except that it didn't seem like the vision was meant for me. I was just a third-person observer. Chris got ahead of her and blocked her. Hold on. It might be a trap, you realize. Those three were trying to capture you earlier. It probably was meant for you, especially if they conveniently mentioned where they were taking the girl. Kira's brain was still burning with the urgent need to track down their quarry and rescue the kid. So for a second, she contemplated shoving Chris aside. But then she stopped and sighed. Yeah, that could be. But, she inhaled. It doesn't make much difference. They can't be allowed to get away with this, so if you don't mind, step away. Instead of moving to the side, Chris kept walking in the direction she had been going, staying ahead of her. You promised me we would be smart about this. We need a plan. We can't just charge right in. You'll need me, and it wouldn't hurt to talk to Leah and Stephanie first. If they're using the girl as bait, she probably isn't in immediate danger, right? She will be worse off if you get killed trying to rescue her than she will if we spend an extra fifteen minutes making sure you don't get killed and do rescue her. Kira wasn't about to disagree, though she disliked the thought of delaying the search as long as that. Yeah, I guess. Now let's rent a car, or you can call Leah while I do that. He took out his cell. Agreed. As soon as she'd heard the report... Inezka had left their new temporary headquarters behind, conscripting a random, low-ranking witch who had experience with American cards and roads to act as a driver. The other senior members were busy with other things, but Inezka was able to send them a message during the ride. They would be on standby, and those who could spare the time would come to her side at once. It would not take long for them to join her. Having sent the texts, Inezka put away her phone, straightened her black hair, and folded her hands in her lap looking straight ahead as the young woman in the driver's seat took them deeper into West Virginia. Graham, mistress, the witch named Tatiana commented. They will have gone by now. Shall I keep driving in the same direction, or do you want me to stop where they were sighted? Inezka raised a hand, not as a rebuke or to cast a spell, but as a gesture of casual authority. Go to the site, I told you, and stay there while I inspect the scene. I want to examine all the evidence they left so we can determine which direction they are headed. We might also need to wait for input from the elders. If by some chance it is a trap, do not fear. I will deal with it. Tatiana nodded and agreed, widely choosing not to argue. Anezka appreciated that the girl was willing to ask intelligent questions, but everyone in the orthodoxy needed to understand their place in the hierarchy and act accordingly. And it was, Anezka felt, extremely unlikely that the council had laid a trap for them. The witches who had finally picked up their trail had not come to any harm, and Inezka could sense their auras ahead. They were still there, watching over the scene. Further, if the council meant to pick off high-ranking orthodoxy members, 
They probably would not have guessed that Inezga would be willing to investigate matters like this herself, with virtually no backup. Granted, they had all seen her personally lead the attack on the Lovecraft estate, but most powerful leaders were not as bold as she was. Some had implied that she was reckless, yet their coven had flourished under her dominion. She scoffed at such petty criticisms. Soon, they arrived in the little town of Barbersville in the far west of West Virginia, near the state's juncture with southern Ohio and eastern Kentucky. The psychic splatter the scouts had picked up, the careless magical residue that one of the council had left behind, probably by accident while in a hurry, was located on a back road off the interstate, near the Guyandot River, which flowed through the middle of the town. It was a hilly, heavily wooded region, where primeval forests took over as soon as one was outside the immediate grasp of civilization. It reminded Inezka of the Carpathian region in western Ukraine. The two scouts, a man and a woman, were standing guard when the car pulled up. Of course, they had diligently deployed magical barriers against the unwelcome eyes and ears of the locals. Once the vehicle was inside the cloaking dome, Inezka raised her hand again. Stop here, she instructed the driver. Tatiana brought the car to a halt and, remembering her earlier orders, waited while Inezka climbed out. The grandmistress instantly began scanning the earth, the air, the atmospheric moisture, and the trees and bugs and human litter, anything that might have absorbed the slightest trace of magic. Five seconds later, she had a fairly good assessment of what had happened here, but she nonetheless allowed the two scouts to approach her and give their reports. Grandmistress, they said in unison and gave shorts bows of their heads. The young woman continued. We estimate they stopped here and something happened to frighten them or disturb them emotionally, so they hurried off. The young man nodded. Yes, it could have happened no more than three, perhaps four hours ago at most, likely two or three. Unfortunately, they cleaned up after themselves well enough that we have not been able to determine where they went from here. Anesca gave them a curt nod of acknowledgement, then stepped past them, extending her hands and letting her eyes glaze over as her consciousness expanded for nearly a square kilometer. The river. Her subordinates were reasonably skilled, but they likely hadn't attempted to examine running water, which was usually an anthema to any stable magical process. But Inezka knew better. Not everything in a river moved along with the water. Her inner sight descended through the rushing, churning torrent, seeking out tree branches stuck against banks, large rocks submerged at the bottom, and living creatures hiding out in tiny grottos that might have witnessed the council's error. A moment later, she had it. A familiar aura signature, the scent of Mother LeBlanc, and it smelled of nostalgia. Nostalgia and intentionality. The waters of the Guyandot wended their way into a larger river, the Ohio, if Inezga was not mistaken, based on her recollection of maps of the region. She was almost positive that the Ohio River, a long way to the west, joined the Mississippi. Then the Mississippi River flowed more or less due south until it emptied into the Gulf of Mexico just past LeBlanc's home city of New Orleans. Inezga blinked once, and her eyes returned to normal. She turned back to the two scouts, who were trying not to disturb her while also looking diligent. They turned their attention toward the Grand Mistress as she strode in their direction. They are headed for New Orleans after all, Inezga stated, and I suspect they mean to go west first, then south. Perhaps they think they will fool us or lose us by doing so instead of taking the more direct route. Perhaps this is all a diversion, and they truly mean to head for the west coast, but I doubt it. The scouts were clearly burning with curiosity to hear more, but they obediently waited rather than try to rush their leader with stupid questions. Inezga went on. Remain here. Others of the Elder Council will arrive shortly to confer with you. No, I have changed my mind. You! She pointed at the male scout. Go ahead a short way and continue searching for traces of their passage. Anything that might help us determine if they are heading northwest or southwest, but certainly west. I have no doubt of it. Yes, Grandmistress, the man said. Wasting no time, he turned and jumped, floating across the river and vanishing into the trees. Minutes later, a black car pulled up beside the one Inezka had ridden in and out stepped Vasily. As usual, he looked dour and gaunt-faced, but his eyes gleamed with excitement. Ah, 
he sighed. I can smell them. They must have stopped here and experienced something terrible. Such a pity. It feels as though one of them almost died or someone went mad or did something to threaten them all with discovery. Then they all convened to try to snuff out the effects of it before hurrying away. They did a poor job of wiping this place clean of their tracks, however. Anezga smiled. Indeed. And as I was linked to Mother LeBlanc's mind for a short period, I can easily sense the residues of her thoughts and emotions atop those of the others. My reading suggests that they are fleeing west, intending then to turn south toward New Orleans. Excellent. Vasily came closer, and he and Inezga walked toward the river, out of earshot of the young female scout, as well as the drivers of their cars. Quietly, Vasily added, It will still be difficult to track them. Alas, that we no longer have Pavla to handle such things. Her face hardened, and Inezga snapped. I know that. It is useless to lament what has already happened. The loss of Pavla was an inconvenience, but not an insurmountable one. All we need is enough power to penetrate the Council's cloak for a moment or two to glimpse their exact location and get some idea of their plans. Then we can move in and finish them off. Looking away from her right-hand man, Anezga pulled out her phone and called Milena. While waiting for the other witch to answer, she examined the sky. It was about two hours past dawn here in the eastern part of the United States. Milena and the others on the train would be a few hours earlier, probably into the Pacific time zone by now. Milena answered on the fourth ring. Aneska, how good of you to call me. I would like to inform you that— Aneska interrupted. How close are you to being able to perform the necessary sacrifice? We have made a crucial breakthrough and need the extra power to be delivered to us with all due haste. I was hoping to have it already but I will allow you another, say, three hours at most. That puts us approximately at the original deadline, does it not? Usually you are not tardy with delivering the required results. Milena audibly swallowed. Yes, Grand Mistress, I have obtained a suitable subject, a young child with a faint trace of the gift, and we are on our way by rented car to the safe house in California's Inland Empire region. We have left the train. I can perform a sacrifice of moderate potency at once, if you prefer. But please, allow me to suggest that we wait a short while longer for a still better one. There is an American witch who would likely provide an enormous boon to us. I need only lure her to the safe house, and I feel confident in saying that she will be here soon. Anezka paused. It annoyed her that Milena was being so vague. This witch, might it be Kira McDonough, by any chance— a slender young woman, early to mid-twenties, with hair dyed black? It, uh, Milena responded. Had occurred to me that it might be her, but we could not confirm that. I suspect it is. Even if it is someone else, however, her strength is substantial. Sacrificing her will be worth a short wait, I assure you. And once we have her, we can sacrifice the child as well for yet more benefit. Our coven will possess more than enough power to complete the task of locating the council. Anezga stroked her chin. Child sacrifices were generally avoided since they caused more public outcry than killing adults. But there were ways of diverting the populace's attention from them. Under the circumstances, given the importance of locating LeBlanc at all costs, Anezga felt the choice was clear. Do it, she instructed Milena. But do not hesitate too long. Kill the child first if Kira does not show up by the deadline. And assuming you are successful, as you almost always are, inform me immediately. I will begin the scrying ritual in two hours' time, and I can hold off releasing the spell for another hour thereafter. Remember, if by some chance both Kira and the child escape, select another subject at once. She hung up. Milena understood what she meant by that, of course. She was not the sort to quail about moral questions when it came to her duties. Losing Hannah or Daniela would be unfortunate but the orthodoxy could afford to spare them more easily than it could afford to let the council get away. Anezga turned back to Vasily. We need a proper ritual chamber. Find a nice theater or university auditorium in Huntington up ahead. It is a large enough city to have what we require. Vasily, who had listened in on the phone conversation, nodded. With pleasure. Chapter 20 As soon as the front door was open, Milena stepped in and narrowed her eyes. Someone has been here, she observed. 
There are tracks in the dust, and at least two of the traps have been sprung. We will look into it in a moment, but first... She stood aside and flourished her hand. Daniela, holding the kidnapped girl firmly and keeping a hand clapped over her mouth, came in first, followed by Hannah. Milena shut the door. Hannah's brow furrowed. The intruder was not here long ago. Yesterday, perhaps, I believe it was someone with the gift. There are traces of magic here that are not of our coven, something foreign and amateurish. Milena tensed at that. Who could it be? It was physically and logistically impossible for Kira, or whoever the young woman on the train was, to have arrived here before they did. Strange, Milena conceded. There are many eccentric people in this city. Perhaps a hedge witch, a fortune teller, or some such person sensed the spells laid here and blundered in and out of dumb animal curiosity. It would seem that our defenses drove them out, but we must refortify. Kira will be here soon. Raising a hand, she mapped a pathway up the stairs that would avoid the remaining traps and curses, both the magical and mundane ones. Then she turned to Daniela. Give me the girl. I will see to her for now. Go fetch my altar and the rest of our things. I can begin the ritual of power transference in advance and keep it in stasis while you and Hannah prepare for our guest's arrival. Daniela shoved Jessica Trammell into the smaller witch's arms. Yeah, understood. Looking annoyed at having to once again do all the grunt work and manual labor, she stomped to their car. Milena looked down at the child. They had cast a relaxation spell on her to keep from panicking and crying out or trying to run away. There was still a vague sheen of fear in her wide brown eyes, but otherwise, she was as placid and compliant as a young child could be. Come, my dear, Milena told her in English, beginning to ascend the stairs. We are going to take a rest while I show you the room you'll be staying in. One of my friends will be coming over soon. Does that sound fun? After I talk to her, you can go home and see your parents again. All will be well. The girl's head moved a half inch to indicate that she had heard, but otherwise she did not react. Milena carried her up the stairs, avoiding the hole where one of the steps had collapsed, and prancing her way through the web of spell traps. She set the child on her feet once they reached the second story. Leading her by the hand, Milena took Jessica to a storage room near the back of the house, essentially an oversized closet that had no windows. Stay here she said, I will be back with a chair and a pillow. She did not consider herself a monster. There was no reason for the girl to be uncomfortable during the short amount of time she had left in the world. She did find it distasteful to lie to a young child and sacrifice her, but the coven's needs came before the life of any one person, and Milena's honor and reputation within the order would soar after their ultimate success. Once she had found the necessary furniture— Milena left Jessica where she was and magically sealed the door. Then, inhaling, she went down to help Hannah and Daniela haul the altar upstairs. She might also have time to help them lay the traps, but the ritual took priority, and the two of them could handle the defensive preparations. Soon, Milena reminded herself, everything would come together. Soon. Anesca tilted her chin down then up again in a curt and imperious gesture of approval. This will suffice. It is not superlative, but so long as the task is accomplished, it matters little how glamorous our surroundings are. Vasily chortled in his dry voice. It is harder to find truly exceptional accommodation outside the larger cities. But as you say, expecting to always be coddled is the sort of thing our enemies would do. We pride ourselves on being able to make do in any setting. He was, Anesca realized, attempting to flatter her by parroting what she had said before. She paid in no heed one way or another. Yes, bring everyone in and ensure that our lower-ranking people are in position to move immediately once the scrying succeeds. I am willing to give Milena an hour longer than I should for the sake of her supposedly brilliant plan, but scouts and field troops have no excuse to delay once the target is in sight. Of course. Vasily marched out of the room to repeat her orders to the other elder members and relay the latter portion to their reconnaissance personnel. The temporary lodgings he had found were at a local hotel, Anesca supposed qualified as being in the upper middle range as far as quality went. In addition to securing rooms for all of them, 
with the aid of a certain amount of compulsion and persuasion magic. They had also rented the use of a convention office which, once properly shielded from scrutiny, would make an effective ritual chamber. Anezga arranged the chairs around the main central table so that she would be at the head and the other elders would be able to sit in their proper position relative to their standing within the orthodoxy, as well as form an effective magical circle. Milena, of course, could not be present in person, but she represented the other half of the working to come. If she failed, nothing the rest of the coven's leadership did today would matter much. Vasily and the others filed in. They all had the appropriate mood of solemn focus, as was customary before the casting of a major and powerful spell. But there was a noticeable undercurrent of gleeful excitement. Anezga did not chastise them for it. She felt the same way, and she trusted their expertise and self-discipline. None of them, she was confident, would allow personal feelings to get in the way of the passionless task that lay ahead. Once everyone had taken their seats, Anezga looked at Vasily. All the scouts are in place, Grand Mistress, he declared. As you requested earlier, some have remained at points in the Northeast to secure the territory we conquered previously. But the bulk of them, around eighty percent, are poised to fan out in search of the Council the instant we discern their location. Flexing her hands, Anezga replied, Good. Then she clapped once, causing the electric lights to go out. Another clap, and the wicks of the candles on the table burst into emerald flames, first a bright profusion of fire, then a normal-sized but eerily green steady glow. Elder witches and warlocks of the mighty orthodoxy, she intoned in Russian, we are gathered here to snuff out our greatest enemies once and for all. They shall be revealed to us. They can hide no longer. Milena, are you there? We call out to you as one mind, seeking the link to your consciousness, your power, and the lifeblood of the ones you shall slay upon the unhallowed altar of sacrifice. Milena! As the minds of the elders linked, and the dark powers they shared began to circulate among them, they all felt the faint presence of their absent member. But it took longer than they would have liked for her to respond. I am here, Grand Mistress, and all others. Everything is ready, and Kira approaches now. Her power will be ours, I swear it. Her life and the girls will lead us to victory. Kira and Chris sat in their new but temporary ride, an SUV, with Chris behind the wheel. I haven't driven anything but my Jeep, he admitted. But this was the biggest thing they had, so it's better than trying to adjust to a goddamn compact Toyota or something. Kira waved a hand. Right, and I've only driven my bike lately. You'll do fine. Now, go, go, go. I'm willing to spend time making a plan, but we can do that while we drive. Ha, we, she says, he shot back, and pressed the button to start the car. Though he was a little awkward at first, Chris seemed to have the hang of the vehicle by the time they were a quarter mile from the train station. Once he was comfortable, he filled Kira in on the details of his conversation with Leah. Okay, get this. Leah and Stephanie were doing some research on possible orthodoxy activity around here, and they say they located a safe house in, drumroll, Jerupa Valley. Steph scoped the place out and has some intel on the types of defenses they have, though if the witches are there, they might have beefed things up further. Kira blinked. Guess I hired the right people after all. Okay, what's the address? Clearing his throat, Chris went on. I have it, but first, another suggestion. Leah said she's coming out, and I think we should wait for her. She was at your place instead of her own, apparently, so that shaves five or ten minutes off the trip. But still, we'll need to wait for her to arrive. She's not sure if Stephanie can make it or not. And something about Stephanie being cursed to see pink spots eternally, which they hope you can help her with, though she might be able to cure herself. And she mentioned that she had been in touch with Pavla. Kira scowled and pinched the bridge of her nose. Jesus, is that all? Mother wasn't sighted flapping over the valley, was he? It would be nice if we could just focus on one thing at a time. A little girl's life is at stake. Chris reached over and put a hand on her arm. I know, and we'll save her. But let's take our time with this. Think of everything you know about these people, and on the basis of that, slow down and tell me how you plan to go into this safe house without getting yourself burned to a crisp or turned into a dung beetle or human-sacrificed. He had a point. 
Kira thought about the vision the witches had left for her, and hearing Chris's mention of sacrifice clarified the meaning of what she had seen. She recalled a passage from the book that Kim's friend had lent her about how some cultures and magical traditions believed that sacrificing a person of power would transfer their strength to those who spilled their blood. Within the magical remainder of the psychic message were the witch's thoughts, some of which revolved around her, Kira. I'm the one they want, she concluded. This is all a ruse to lure me into their clutches so they can use me as fuel. Well, they're going to fail at that. But I'm going to succeed at getting Jessica Trammell back to her parents. Chris gave her a faint smile. You've never been lacking when it comes to motivation, resolve, determination, and that type of thing. I think you will succeed, but let's make sure of it. I don't want to wake up tomorrow remembering that yesterday was the day your luck finally ran out. Me neither, Kira quipped, then realized how stupid that sounded. Um, I mean, waking up in, uh, hell or wherever. Damn it, I can't make clever-ass comments right now. Chris shrugged. Nobody's perfect. Soon they arrived at a drive through place not far from the address Leah had given them. It was early and they hadn't had time for breakfast on the train, so Chris got them some food and coffee. It was not only for nourishment, but also so they could wait for a while in the parking lot without looking too suspicious. The hope was that Leah wouldn't be too long in arriving. Both their phones buzzed at approximately the same time. Kira, who was keyed up in getting into the proverbial zone of body-mind coordination, was able to slip hers out before Chris could. She swiped the screen. Oh, shit, she relayed. It's Stephanie. She has to work later. She wants to help but is worried that her curse is going to fuck everything up since she can barely drive, has trouble seeing, etc. What the hell did those bitches do to her? Chris squirmed in a seat. I don't know, but it sounds unpleasant. Don't let them do the same thing to you. The rest of the message was Stephanie expressing her embarrassment at how stupid it was to be worried about an inconvenient hex, let alone getting to work on time when a kid's life hung in the balance. Kira knew how she felt. After a moment's consideration, Kira texted her back, saying to come with Leah and they would see what they could do to help her. All right, she murmured. I want to charge in. And I'm sure you guessed, but I'm going to admit that you're probably right about waiting for our backup to roll in. Steph texted back, pointing out that Leah had already left, but she would be coming by herself, and apologized if she was late to the party. Kira frowned. Damn it, forgot about that. I hope it's safe for her to drive. Still, we'll adapt. She paused. But we can't wait for her. Once Leah shows up, it's go time. They ate drank coffee, and stalled for another twenty minutes before heading toward the address. A faint sense of unease crept in as they drew nearer their destination. Though Jerupa Valley was for the most part pretty nice, the neighborhood around the Orthodoxy safe house had a strange air of desolation. It wasn't far from the freeway or from other perfectly normal areas, so it was difficult to determine why. Kira supposed it was mostly in her head. Chris slowed after they turned onto the street where the house lay. Okay, this is the place, approximately. Unless you say otherwise, I'm going to wait here instead of trying to find the house yet. Don't need to clue them in that we're here until you're ready to do your thing. Kira nodded. She was still wearing her jacket, so the witches probably couldn't perceive how close she was. But a random car slowly rolling past the driveway a couple of times would be a dead giveaway to anyone. While they waited for Leah... Kira found her mind turning to something else. Pavla had been an upper-middle-rank witch in the orthodoxy, she recalled, and she and Stephanie had held their own against her in battle with difficulty. Similarly, Kira had to assume the three coven members on the train were at least as powerful as Pavla, and the petite brunette leader was quite possibly more powerful. From what the book said, sacrificial magic was a task best saved for experienced adepts. And yet... Kira had defeated her and the two minions single-handedly. Luck had played a part, to be sure. They had seemingly underestimated her. And in the narrow confines of the train, their superior numbers didn't mean as much. Today, Kira would be storming a defended location on the Orthodoxy's new home turf, and the witches had the advantage of foreknowledge. It wouldn't be as easy this time. But the more I think it over, she reflected, the stranger it is that I have any chance at all. 
I've been a magic user for less than a year, and I haven't had that much formal training. Am I really that powerful? Chris was the first to answer his phone this time when both their devices buzzed again. It's Leah. She'll be here in five minutes. Kira nodded. They're extremely anxious to sacrifice me, probably because they figure my talent will give the orthodoxy a huge boost. So I suppose I'm pretty fucking special. Chapter 21 Aneska's eyes, closed until this moment, flew open, and a faint red glow emanated from her irises. Yes, she urged. Begin. Draw her in. Already our power is on the cusp of what is needed. Her voice rang out, echoing through the makeshift chamber and across the astral plane to the mind of Milena. Aneska's hands lay claw-like upon the surface of the table, her black nails digging into the wood. Milena had begun the rite of sacrifice in advance, starting the process with a single drop of her own blood. It was enough to create a small but intoxicating infusion of power and entice the ancient and shadowy spirits who were involved in transferring the magical essence of the victim into the intended vessels, them, the Orthodoxy's elders. And since all of them were united in their intensity of purpose, focus, and self-discipline, they were at the peak of their strength before the sacrifice even took place. Each of the senior witches had come to the day's endeavors well-rested, well-fed, and confident of success. It was difficult to maintain the astral connection to Milena and her altar hundreds of miles away, while at the same time beginning the spell of scrying and holding it in suspension over the Council of Thaumaturgists, ready to descend like a bolt of lightning and crack open their barrier of invisibility. But they had done it before— and Ineska was one of the most powerful leaders the coven had ever had. Mother LeBlanc would fail. She, the mightiest of her order, was at best Ineska's equal, and she presided over a small group of tired, hungry, hunted, and defeated people. They lacked the numbers, organization, and ruthless will of the orthodoxy. All it would take was the knowledge of where they were. Then the hammer stroke would fall and with the deaths of LeBlanc and the others, North America would be joined with Russia and Eastern Europe in the mightiest witch empire the world had seen in ages, perhaps the largest of all time. Milena's voice sounded within their collective consciousness. She is here. Kira is approaching. She is strong and wily, but we are well prepared and shall not make the same mistakes twice. Be ready. Aneska smiled, and her hands trembled. We are, Milena. Do it. Kira, Chris, and Leah crouched behind the fence. Kira had risked the expenditure of a little extra magic to cloak them and their cars from sight, hearing, or scrying. By this point, she was good enough at basic spells like that for them to deplete her stamina only a little bit. All right, Kira told her friends. I can't wait for Stephanie. If she gets here and it seems like I need help, Send her in, but we can't delay any longer while that little girl is in danger. Leah, I skimmed the stuff you sent. Didn't have time to read it in detail, but I got enough out of it that I have a plan. Trust me. Chris nodded. His sardonic smile implied that he was about to make a smart-ass remark, but he did not. Leah wore a serious, earnest expression as she often did. We trust you, Kira, but telling us what your plan is would make it easier for us to help if need be. Remember, it's you they want. I would wager money that they're willing to wait another five minutes for you to walk through their front door, though I agree we need to move soon for the child's sake. Kira flexed her hands in mild frustration. Okay, here's the gist of it. What's the saying? I think the military uses it. No plan survives contact with the enemy or something like that. I'll probably have to change it and make shit up as I go along. That's happened pretty much every time we've gone into battle. Nonetheless, she took a deep breath. I'm going to try a trick that's so basic, they might overlook it or figure I couldn't possibly be using something so obvious against them. I'll conjure an illusion of myself and send it through the front door. Then I'll conjure like three or four more and have all of them attack the house from different angles, with the real me hitting one of the windows at the same time. They'll figure it out pretty quick, but it might throw them off long enough for me to get the edge. Leah nodded. Okay, good, what else? Kira coughed. Find the girl and get her out of there. As much as I'd like to hang around and beat the shit out of those three, rescuing the kid is the important part. 
If need be, I can turn her over to you guys, and then I can hold the witches off while you take Jessica back to her parents. Chris's eyes widened in amazement. That's it? Yeah, she muttered. That's it. Well, if I do the illusions right, they ought to have a little more substance than usual. I used the basic version against... She stopped herself. Leah grimaced. Yes, I recall. It worked well against Johnny and Sven, but as you say, it won't be nearly as effective against experienced magic users. Kira stood up. Trust me, keep an eye on what's going on and stand by to grab the girl. Before either of them could delay her with further questions, she sprinted around the outside corner of the fence. Kira! Leah called. Damn it! All right, let's get in our cars, one of us on each side of the house. I hope no one sees us stuffing a child into our vehicles and driving away fast. Ugh! Chris raised a palm. Don't worry. The girl's parents technically hired us so they can vouch for our legitimacy. Leah stared. Then her face lit up. We have a customer? That's great! For the first time in far too long, she grinned like an overexcited schoolgirl. Then she recalled what was going on and got back to business. Yeah! Move out! Meanwhile, Kira was halfway around the fence. Once safely out of reach and view of her friends, she cast the spell to summon the illusory copies of herself, but this time she did something different. Particles of dirt, chunks of earth and rock from the barren lot, and sticks and leaves from the nearby half-dead trees floated where Kira crouched and formed small whirlwinds around her. These formed the cores, giving each of the holographic figures a small degree of physical mass and existence. The illusion shimmered into being around them. Before dispatching them to do their jobs, Kira attempted one more thing. Recalling how the witches had spread their oars out over the whole train in a vague cloud, she tried the same thing with her magical signature. Her mind's eye perceived a white gold light, like the sun, splitting apart and dimming as it filtered outward. It became less a single main node and more a series of shining masses. It wasn't quite the same as the uniform haze her adversaries had created, but it ought to be good enough. She tied the main light points to the doppelgangers. Okay, girls, she said in her mind, and her thoughts became commands to the pseudo-beings she had created. It's go time. One of the illusions jumped up and vaulted over the fence, Kira could hear the swirling gravel within scrape the wood, which was a good sign. The figure ran parallel to the house's side before angling toward the front door. Kira felt rather than heard or saw the witches notice the intruder and drew a sharp breath. Then she waved her hand like a sergeant leading a squad into battle. She and the other four copies jumped the fence in unison. She had two of them assault the closer side of the house and brought the other two with her to the rear. There was no way to be certain yet, but she suspected Jessica Trammell was being held somewhere toward the back and on the second floor. A hunch. Then my hunches are usually correct or close to it. We'll find out soon enough. She soared down from the top of the fence, augmenting her movements through basic magic. She kept one of the doppelgangers with her while commanding the other to circle around to the house's far side, the only direction from which none of the other doubles had yet attacked it. Within the building, she could faintly hear women's voices calling to one another in Russian. As Kira jumped toward the nearest window on the top floor, something toward the front of the house crashed loudly and set the whole building shuddering. Damn, must have been a hell of a trap, whatever it was. My poor fake illusion. Hope it didn't get hurt. She sailed through the air while conjuring a shield that surrounded her body like a transparent suit of armor and smashed through the window as the glass shattered into hundreds of fragments around her. She saw a dark, dirty bedroom that was empty of anything except a bed covered with a filthy old sheet and a wooden dresser in the corner. Kira came to a rest on her hands and knees, thankful the shield protected her from the glass shards. Now the girl. Where is she? There's so much magic floating around this place that I can't get a bead on her position, but it's not too big of a house— I can look for her the old-fashioned way as long as the witches are distracted. She sprang to her feet, rushed to the door, and flung it open, ready to fight at a split-second's notice. To her surprise, the hallway beyond was empty, but it presented more doors than she would have liked, two on the same side of the hall as the room she'd come from, and another two on the opposite side, 
next to the stairwell. While trying to decide which one to open first, Kira sent her mind out to her illusory clones, attempting to discern which of them had been attacked, or if any magical presences were close to them. The feedback that returned to her was a chaotic mess of thaumaturgic impulses, astral strife, and an overall feeling of hostility. There was something beneath the noise as well. A dark, loathsome, foreboding impression tied to the house or something within it, rather than to the battle or any spells being cast. Her trio of adversaries had managed to disperse their auras. It was impossible to guess where they might be, except through logic and her physical senses. Kira figured an interior room was more secure than one with a window, so she bolted across the hallway and pulled open the first door. Within was nothing save a few boxes filled with what looked like old photographs, rusting cookware, and moth-eaten clothes. Before she could open the next door, two figures appeared from around the corner. The first was her, or a magical facsimile thereof, and the second was the tallest of the Orthodoxy's three agents on the train, the tough-looking one with curly hair. Her eyes widened at the sight of Kira, and her mouth fell open— then something in Russian or a similar language echoed down the stairwell. Kira kicked her in the stomach, and the woman fell back a half-step, but the blow didn't seem to do much good. Her hands wrapped around Kira's ankle before she could retract her leg. Oh, crap! She's resilient. And now she knows for sure I'm the real Kira, since while the illusions might have been able to spring a trap or two, they're not capable of kicking someone. Are they? Since her athletic abilities were still partially boosted by the charm she had cast on herself, Kira jumped up, braced the foot the woman had caught against her abdomen, and swiped her other foot across the witch's face. Her head snapped to the side and a bruise appeared on her jaw, but she didn't go down. She did let Kira's foot go, though. Kira tumbled through space and rolled into the wall, crashing there but springing to her feet in time for the witch to throw out her hands in a spell. Kira dodged to the side as a trident of lightning bolts leapt from the bigger woman's hands and smashed into the wall, shattering boards and setting them on fire. A stray bolt, a side fork of one of the main ones, branched off and struck Kira in the midsection. But she had enough shield left that it crackled into oblivion, although it weakened the shield and drew sparks from its surface. This one, Kira concluded, isn't the sharpest tool in the shed. She could have set the whole house on fire with that and somehow she failed to notice that I had an active shield despite having her goddamn hands on my ankle. She summoned one of her illusions to enter the fray. It wouldn't be able to do much, but if Kira could create enough motion and disorder, the witch might get confused as to which was the real target. But no sooner had one of the doppelgangers appeared than the woman lunged at Kira with frightening speed and force. Kira tried to twist away but took a strong blow to the side, enough to stun her and interrupt her movements. Then the bigger woman launched a punch at her face. Gritting her teeth in pain as the torso strike exacted its toll, Kira managed to duck. The witch's fist cracked the board where Kira's head had been, and Kira kicked her in the leg while striking her with a wave of concussive force. Ugh! The big woman grunted, toppling over and cursing, either in Russian or her native tongue. She flung up an arm as her rump struck the floor and a beam of fiery plasma shot from her hand. Kira cried out in alarm, summoning another shield. It formed at the last instant, so some of the blazing ray got trapped inside it, creating a stationary fireball that Kira could feel singeing her clothes. The rest of the plasma ricocheted and refracted, igniting other parts of the walls. Behind where Daniela had fallen, another bedroom door opened as though by itself, and a woman's voice shouted, Idiot! You will kill her or burn this place down, Kira. We know it's you. If you want to save the girl, come here. We have business to finish. The big woman had risen to a crouch, ready and eager to pounce again, but awaiting further instructions from what could only be their leader. This was Milena, if Kira recalled correctly. The Orthodoxy's chief practitioner of sacrificial magic. Yeah, Kira shouted into the room which was dark aside from a faint reddish glow. And I know what you want with me. Let the little girl go, then I'll come in for a friendly talk. Behind her, she felt an obscure swell of magic and something pressed against her mind. A compulsion spell, a powerful psychic command. 
Kira hadn't expected it. And at first, the spell succeeded, making it impossible for her to refuse. She took two robotic steps toward the open door, then stopped. No! She spun and hurled a confusion spell into the shadowy space at her back. The compulsion weakened, but did not drop. The third witch, the Asian-looking one, must be a specialist in psionic magic, which meant she'd been resistant to it. Daniela roared and charged, knocking Kira against the wall and twisting her right arm behind her back. Do what we say, she barked. She yanked Kira back and drove her toward the black bedroom. Hannah cast another enchantment, a spell of relaxation designed to weaken Kira's will. She was faltering. They were winning. The witches had brought her to the threshold of the room. Hannah stepped out from behind a corner and advanced, watching Kira's back as she maintained the mental attack magic that complemented Daniela's brute force. Kira remembered something Pavla had said about how the orthodoxy often made witches who were complete opposites work together in the interest of balance. She summoned what free will she had left and blasted Daniela with every form of psychic attack she could think of. Fear. Shame. Insecurity. The tall woman, so tough and aggressive, had surprisingly few defenses against the concentrated blast, and Kira saw into her anxieties. Daniela is afraid that Milena will sacrifice her if they screw this up. Kira gasped. They don't trust each other. They're all trying to skate by without getting in trouble, doing this only out of their fear of their grand mistress. Hannah's compelling wave of discouragement strengthened, and Kira felt her knees buckle. But Daniela was almost paralyzed, too. Kira recalled the images of human sacrifice she had seen and placed Daniela's and Hannah's faces on the victims, projecting the hideous spectacles into both their minds. Daniela shrieked. Kira grabbed her, tripped her at the ankle, and tossed her into Hannah. The smaller witch crashed into the wall. From the bedroom, Milena shrieked, What are you doing? Bring her in, you idiots! Kira faced Milena's subordinates and blasted Daniela with fear spells again, combined with percussive kinetic force. The big woman, screaming in terror, was driven over the rail above the stairwell and crashed into the banister on the landing. The last thing Kira saw of the witch was her limping out the front door, shaking in panic. Hannah got up, but Kira was faster. If she's the brains and Daniela was the brawn, she probably sucks at hand-to-hand -hand fighting. Kira punched her in the face. Hannah fell back, mewling in pain, her lips bleeding. She reflexively cast another relaxation spell, but Kira had anticipated it and channeled the effects to her own advantage, settling into the calm focus that came with extensive martial arts training. Then she kicked Hannah in the groin, threw her into the wall again, and dragged her back into the bedroom Kira had entered the house through. Seeing the broken second-story window, Hannah sobbed. No, please. Kira's stomach tightened. She didn't want to kill anyone, especially not a small woman begging for mercy. But then she remembered Jessica Trammell. Sorry, she murmured, and threw the witch out the window. It wasn't that far to the ground, and Hannah managed to cast a slow fall spell on herself halfway down. She still slammed into the dirt hard, but not forcibly enough to be seriously injured or killed. To Kira's surprise, Chris appeared from behind a tool shed and grabbed Hannah as she hesitated. Go home, Chris shouted, shoving her away. Hannah ran without looking back. Milena screamed in rage and cursed in Russian. Why isn't she coming out of that room? Kira wondered. She must still have to do something to prepare for the sacrifice. Now's my chance. Kira dashed past the black bedroom and flung open the closet on the interior side of the hallway. It was empty except for a chair, a pillow, and a little girl with dark hair. Dashing in without thinking, Kira grabbed Jessica around the waist. I'm taking you home, she said, though Jessica seemed to be either sedated or bewitched. She was barely aware of what was going on. She ducked out of the closet, turning her back to Milena's room to protect the girl in case an attack came at her. But strangely, nothing did. Then she ran down the stairs, taking them two at a time and hopping over the collapsed floorboards. Halfway down, she tripped over a wire. Fuck! she shouted, 
Kira hurled Jessica into the air and cast a feather fall spell on her, so the child drifted slowly toward the floor of the living room. Kira wasn't as fortunate and tumbled down the stairs, smashing into walls and rails. Somewhere near the bottom, she felt a magical trap ensnare her. Her head felt like it was encased in thick cotton, and she could barely hear. At the top of her lungs, Kira shouted, Chris! Leah! Come get her! She struggled to her feet. A moment later, Chris appeared in the front doorway. He took in the scene before him in an instant, then ducked forward to snatch up Jessica, who was beginning to whine and squirm. As relaxed as she was, the chaos was starting to get to her. Then he reached out a hand to Kira, helping her up and guiding her out the front door. We're going to make it, Kira thought. They staggered across the lawn, and she put some of her remaining power toward undoing the spell that had deafened her. Her hearing slowly began to return. We pulled this off, we... As though she were connected to a bungee cord, Kira was yanked backward and into the air. She screamed. There was just enough of her magical shield left to prevent every bone in her body from breaking as she crashed through the wall of the second-story master bedroom. The entire wall collapsed and daylight intruded on the unnaturally dark chamber. Kira's body was afire with pain, but she didn't think she was badly hurt, though her head spun. She looked up and rose to a squatting position. A table had been set up in the center of the room, and near it was a hideous altar of black stone topped with a leering gargoyle. It looked like a fountain, and the lower parts were stained with what could only be dried blood. Milena was two feet away, straight razor in hand. Her placid, rather pretty face was twisted with fury. Milena snarled, Now you will die. The razor swept toward Kira's hamstring. Kira's hand shot out and seized the smaller woman's wrist. Though Milena was not as strong, Kira was still in pain and disoriented, and Milena had the advantage of standing, while Kira squatted awkwardly beneath her. The two were evenly matched at that moment. No, Milena spot. Stop it. I am a professional. I do not fail, especially not against people like you. She struck Kira with fear, confusion, and discouragement spells. But Kira was well inured to resisting them, thanks to Hannah's efforts. Milena cast a charm that encased her hand in a small pyramid of heat and flame and drove it into Kira's side. Kira growled in pain and the other witch managed to flip her toward the sacrificial table beside the fountain. Being close to the repulsive thing, Kira could feel the stolen life energies throbbing within it. It was almost depleted, but still providing a marginal benefit to the orthodoxy. Without it, there would be no sacrifices. Milena swiped again with the razor. Kira dodged and kicked the witch away, then turned and combined a concussive force spell with a simple punch directed at the fountain altar. The gargoyle shattered into black fragments and cracks ran through the rest. Any blood spilled into it would leak. The malign aura that emanated from it grew weaker. Milena shrieked in horror. No, 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 she howled. It is priceless. Even if we can't get the full benefit of sacrificing you, you are still marked for death. Nothing will stop us from... As she stepped forward, this time trying to slash her opponent's throat, Kira realized she meant it. Milena would never forgive her and would make killing her a personal priority until the end of time. Kira thought, I didn't want it to come to this. She caught Milena's wrist again. Then a voice echoed through the room, clearly projected there by someone else. It was speaking Russian, but the cold, booming, imperious tone of demanding impatience was easy enough to understand. One of the two had to die. Now. Kira twisted Milena's wrist until it broke. When the witch screamed, Kira seized the razor and in one motion swept it across her throat. Milena's eyes bulged as her blood flowed down her chest. The altar throbbed again. He was thirsty. Kira pushed Milena away and kicked her to the floor, depriving the fountain of its offering. As Milena died, none of her power, energy, or life force was returned to her employers. The room grew quiet. Looking at the corpse at her feet, Kira's anger swelled. Not only at the orthodoxy, but at herself. 
Fuck you for making me do this again, she snapped. Aneska's voice caught in her throat as the truth of what had happened unfolded before them. The fledgling spell, held suspended while it waited for the infusion of power, was impatient to be released. All it would take to tear open the veil of magic that protected the council was a few drops of blood. Kira's, the girl's, Milena's, Hannah's, or Daniela's. But the altar was damaged. It received nothing, and it never would again. No! Aneska roared. The other senior members flinched, and their contributions to the collective scry wavered and faded. No! Aneska stood up, turned around, and faced the wall. For the next five minutes, she could think of nothing save her urge, her need, to rip Kira McDonough's heart out of her chest and crush it before her eyes. As she stood in total silence, no one disturbed her. No one said anything. Chapter 22 Mary Mitchell stared at the little tree, her face lighting up with a girlish joy that Mother LeBlanc had not seen from her in years. It's incredible, truly incredible, Mary gushed as she raised her hands to run them over the leaves. I had no idea that palm trees were not truly trees. Well, I suppose I do recall seeing something about the order, phylum, and so forth that they belong to, but somehow it did not register in my mind until now. The Blanc smiled at her. There is no substitute for first-hand experience, it's true. The sun was warm, and the late morning air was humid, but curiously invigorating. It felt like home. Mary shook her head and peered at the palm fronds and the trunk. Then her eyes moved to the ground. She was likely linking her mind with the rudimentary consciousness of the plant to gain a deeper understanding of its root system. They're giant dandelions, only woody around the trunk and with green petals instead of yellow. In a manner of speaking, a form of flowering plant. Oh, this is embarrassing in all honesty. It brings to the fore how little I've traveled in these last few decades and how badly I've neglected the flora of the subtropics. The Blanc waved a slim, dark hand at the vast, swampy, almost jungle-like yard. Well, it is my hope that we will be able to spend a reasonable amount of time here to rest in peace and safety. There will be work to do, but you should have enough free time to become well acquainted with all the plants of the bayou. Or a good sampling of them, if nothing else. Then she frowned. That species of palm is not native to this region, by the way. You might want to consider moving on to something more appropriate to the history of New Orleans area. I'm not sure who planted it. In any event, it has taken well to the climate here. Indeed, Mary looked up. Surprising that the sun is so warm so early in the day and this deep into autumn. Well, no, it's not surprising on paper. In real life, though, it's different. I feel like a child on vacation. How could I have spent so much time in the Northeast? She chuckled and returned to her quasi-scientific examinations proceeding to a patch of weeds and flowers that grew in a particularly low and damp patch of the house's backyard. The Blanc let her be, turning away and walking back to the building. It was an old plantation-style mansion, though it had been built only about a century ago, well, after the ugliest events associated with the South had come to an end. It belonged to an old friend of hers. She had been coy about divulging his name to her fellow council members since in New Orleans— she felt an obligation to keep some secrets to herself. They were outside the city in the middle of nowhere, though civilization was not far away. As such, they were protected by obscurity while still being within the massed and unique place aura New Orleans exuded. Most of the council was inside. The younger members, LeBlanc noted, were having some difficulty adjusting to the place. It had not undergone any renovations to speak of since it was first built— so it lacked electricity and had only limited plumbing, let alone central air conditioning. Fortunately, the worst of the summer heat was over for the year. Crystal Green sat on an old, slightly moldy couch before a huge bay window, fanning herself with a hat. Faint particles of snow and frost appeared in the air as it moved over her face. Pardon me, she commented. I shouldn't look a gift horse in the mouth but I'm over-accustomed to the climate of upstate New York. Anything over 70 degrees combined with humidity and I start to have a rough time, I'm afraid. Or anything over 80, even when it's dry. LeBlanc, not offended, shrugged. 
Believe it or not, I don't greatly care for humid heat either. But you might say I'm used to it, given how much time I spent here when I was younger. In any event, it should not climb much above eighty, and then only for a few hours as the afternoon goes on. Crystal's face fell. It will get cooler in the weeks to come, won't it? Slightly, yes, LeBlanc explained. Nola experiences three entire months of winter, although those are some weeks away yet, during which the high temperature generally stays around 65. If we are here that long, you ought to enjoy yourself. Walking past the Duchess, LeBlanc went to the ground floor guest room. Samantha had insisted on the best bed in the house for James, which was an old four-poster, a bit mildewed, but otherwise perfectly comfortable. LeBlanc asked, How is he? Good, Samantha answered with a wan look that might have qualified as a smile. I was so worried when he had that episode right before we crossed out of West Virginia. LeBlanc grimaced. James had, after passing out on their first day in the moving truck, come awake in a strange panic, as though his mind was still delirious from a nightmare, and begun spitting out fragments of incantations tied to emotional echoes and general expulsions of power. Everyone had pitched in to calm him down beside the river that flowed through Barbersville. But the damage had been done. The orthodoxy had surely noticed the flare-up of untamed magic and picked up their trail. But in the end, they had gotten away. Driving in shifts, they'd been able to make it all the way to St. Louis, and then to Nola virtually without stopping. Samantha continued, But he's improved a lot. Still needs his rest, but I can tell he's turning a corner. If we can stay here for two or three weeks, I think he'll make a full recovery. LeBlanc smoothed her multicolored dress. Excellent. Let's have lunch, shall we? I'll get everyone together. She provided the food, pulling entire dishes out of the folds of her garment and serving them on the fine china and silverware that came with the house. Her fellow thaumaturgists, none of whom had ever figured out how she managed her tricks, applauded and offered half-serious guesses as to what powers she still hid from them. She slid a casserole down the dinner table. Perhaps one day I'll reveal it to you all, but for now, eat and be merry. They passed a good forty minutes on the meal, everyone in good cheer for the first time in what seemed like too long. Hugh Buchanan was genuinely charmed by the old mansion, though he confessed he would miss electrical appliances and found reading at night by candlelight bothersome. Meanwhile, Amanda and Josiah joked like high schoolers, and Rufus and Crystal got into a discussion on the transmutation of heat waves. Azudo spoke to Samantha about James, and the Nigerian seemed to relax, now confident that his mentor would be fine given a little more time. Through it all, the Blanc had remained aloof not in the sense of being cold and disinterested, but in that there were other things on her mind that the others could not possibly have known about, appreciated, or understood. And though they had at long last found a place where they would be safe, there was still work to do, LeBlanc said in a low, casual voice. I'm going to get something to drink. I will be back soon. Though she did not like using magic on her friends, she had placed a subtle enchantment on her words so everyone heard her, but no one paid much attention. It would make it easier for her to slip away. Which she did. The others continued their half-jovial talking as she made her way out the back of the house, losing herself amidst the weeds, willows, cypresses, moss, and muck of the encroaching swamp. A sensation enveloped her as she felt the bayou close around her. And the house and the entire human world of the present century with it passed out of sight and out of mind. It was indescribable, somehow both warm and cold, dreadful and yet ecstatic. There was nothing about it that could rightfully be called thaumaturgy, witchcraft, or any other such term. LeBlanc laughed. This, she realized, was what those without the gift meant when they said something felt magical but that comparison was not valid, because as the old woman advanced, seeing both the substantial changes in the vegetation that had occurred over the decades and the ancient landmarks that had changed not at all, she grasped something else. 
few, if any other people on the planet, were capable of experiencing nostalgia in quite the same way she was, since their lives were more or less capped at a single century. For a moment, she was terrified of herself. By the standards of nearly all things that lived upon the earth, it was unnatural for her memory to stretch as far back in time as it did. And yet, the thing she sought was far older than she was. She had been a little girl when first she had heard about the chalice of old Jack. Another odd shudder went through her. By now, the land was losing the ability to make up its mind if it was dry land or water, but LeBlanc, easily casting the necessary enchantments, glided over the surface. The trees grew larger and denser, rising higher to block out all sight of the outside world, even as the ground sank under the waters. Old Jack was not the true name of the chalice's original owner, of course. It was a nickname that was used out of respect and deference to the power of his real appellation. The man who'd kept the artifact safe at the time had been named Jack, or was it Jock, as well. There was an odd symbiotic relationship between the keeper and the thing they kept safe. The population of birds and frogs and insects grew as she advanced into the wilderness. None of them bothered her, although many watched her pass in silence. And although it was approximately noon, the swamp was strangely as dim as if it were twilight. A more ignorant individual than LeBlanc would have blamed it on the trees, a sudden bout of cloudiness in the sky, or haze in the air. Thinking that it was something so mundane, so readily comprehensible, would have comforted them. LeBlanc was permitted no such luxury. At last, she came to the tree. It had been dead for at least four hundred years, she estimated. And here in the swamp, where the profusion of life also brought rapid decay to all things, it had remained perfectly intact that entire time. It rose from a shallow pool of unusually clear water, surrounded by muck and weeds, and its gnarled branches were smooth and white. LeBlanc closed her eyes. Girl, she heard old Jock say. When you get to the tree, look at the sun. It's easier around noon. That one high curling branch that will block it out, and the shadow will look like an arrow on the water. That's the way you need to head. Go and have a look at it, but don't touch it. It holds things, precious things, that people have right now but won't need till later. You understand? She had not understood. It was clear that the chalice was special and important in some way, but at such a young age, she had no way of knowing what he meant. Nonetheless, she had gone all the way to the edge of the hiding place and had glimpsed the artifact. Then a strange fear had overcome her, and she had turned back before she got close enough for a good look at the thing. Not this time. This was the day, finally, when she would finish what she had started all those years ago. The Blanc followed the shadow of the great branch diagonally forward and to the right from her current position. The clear, shallow water barely moved beneath her feet. Then, abruptly, she was back on solid ground, on a winding path of mud and rocks that twisted away from the swamp and up a forgotten hillock composed of dead plant matter and out-of-place minerals. Notwithstanding the rays of sunshine that had revealed the arrow-shaped shadow, it had grown darker still to the point that it might have been midnight. LeBlanc worked her way up the slope and pushed through sheets of moss, vines, dead roots, and leaves. At last, she found her feet resting in the same position they had when she was only a child. The open space before her seemed smaller than it had back then, of course, since she was far larger now, but it had lost none of its dramatic effect. There was a bowl-shaped depression in the top and center of the mossy hillock, the base of which was lined with chalky white stone or dust or dulled crystal, and around it was a natural fence of thorns. The Blanc reached out. Destroying the thorns seemed unnecessary, so she commanded them to move aside. They did, retracting like masses of snakes to either side, and leaving an opening about four feet wide for her to pass through. At the center of the alabaster hollow was a petrified tree stump on which an old cup sat, it was made of finely worked brass. Nothing about it suggested materials that were expensive. 
and it lacked adornments other than the faint runic script that encircled its neck. But the craftsmanship was incredible. Having rested in the wilderness for spans of time beyond the comprehension of human beings, it was as ageless and pristine as it had been kept in an airtight museum vault. Oh, Jack, the Blanc began. Her voice sounded too loud, though she'd spoken barely above a whisper. I think I know what you store in this cup when you don't need it now, but will need it later. And I believe that the people who want to harm us are using the same method you told people never to use, which was why you gave them this chalice instead. With your permission, I would like to borrow it. I'm a daughter of the bayou, and I have been here before. I was afraid then, but I'm not any more. Turn me away if you have any objections. The hollow responded with silence, though it was not the silence of cold rebuff. It was the quiet that came with peace and contentment. The Blanc bowed her head. So be it. I will return the chalice when I'm done with it. Maybe I can find it a new keeper, too, since it's been so long without one. She stepped forward, reached out, and took the cup from its place. Nothing happened, but the brass felt warm in her hand, and it smelled nice in a way she could not identify. It was a distant and hazy association from her childhood, faded almost into oblivion by the passage of time. Shaking her head to clear it, LeBlanc turned around and left the same way she had come. The day became brighter as she got farther from the hillock and the dead tree, as though an entire night had passed while she was gone, and it was early afternoon the next day. LeBlanc stepped through the weeds and back onto the grassy lawn of the mansion. Mary Mitchell was out back again, sketching the new plants she had discovered with colored pencils in a blank notebook. She looked up. Oh, Mother LeBlanc, where have you been? We were starting to worry, and... She squinted. What is that? LeBlanc held up the chalice, noting how much brighter the brass looked under the natural sun. Now we stand a chance. Chapter 23 Chris and Leah had gone only a couple of blocks away to wait for Kira to rejoin them before they all went back to the train station to deliver Jessica Trammell to her parents. Since the girl was still under a heavy relaxation spell, she did not panic, try to escape, or otherwise draw attention to herself. You know, Chris commented, there's probably an APB or something out to find this kid, so if a cop drives by and sees her, there's going to be hell to pay. Yeah, we could likely get it sorted out once the parents confirm they hired our agency to help with the search, but still, ugh, I'm not in the mood to be mistaken for a kidnapper. Leah reached out a knuckle and stroked the little girl's cheek. That is understandable. And, Chris added, I'm worried about Kira. Even with Pavla's quasi-intervention, those witches were no joke. Leah looked over her shoulder. Wait, a car's coming. I think it's the one you rented before either of them could consider that it might be one of the Orthodoxy's agents. The car stopped and Kira climbed out, waving to them. Both relaxed. Chris murmured, unless they disguise themselves magically to look like her. He opened the car door, stepped out, and shouted at the approaching figure. Hey, what do we have for lunch that your mom made like a day or so before we left your parents' house? Kira stopped, staring at him dumbly. Uh pasta salad? I remember that. Sandwiches? Why the hell are you asking me that? Wait, you're making sure I'm the real Kira. Got it. Yeah, I am. He nodded. You passed the test. All right, get in the car since we'll need to return that damn thing. When he climbed back into Leah's car, she told him Stephanie had just texted her. Since she missed the fight, Leah pointed out, I told her to meet us at the train station. If Kira has the strength left, Maybe they can collaborate on curing her of that god-awful hex. Two cars drove the short distance back to the station, parking near one another. Leah helped Jessica out, noting that the girl was becoming somewhat more responsive. Hey, she asked in her tiny voice. Are we going to see my mom and dad again? Leah smiled. Yes, baby, we're taking you to them right now. This is the station for the train you were on, remember? She chewed on a finger. Okay. Chris exhaled. 
Good to see it's wearing off so things don't look too weird. Um, is there like a law that we have to hand her over to the police instead of just taking her back to her parents? God, I hope not. Kira jogged up. I don't think so, she offered. The cops will probably be relieved that it's all over and they don't have to keep combing the whole town. But then again, they'll probably want to go after the culprits, which could cause some problems. In fact, here comes one now. I think it's the guy I charmed earlier. It was. Is that your child? He asked them. Kira took the lead, realizing she looked like she had recently been in a brawl that had left half a house destroyed. She prepared another light spell to deflect suspicion and smooth the process. No, sir, it's Jessica Trammell. We're with McDonough Investigations, and the parents hired us to find her. We're taking her back to them. She cast the spell to be safe. The officer blinked. Oh. Okay, then. Great. He wandered off. Chris put his arm around Kira's waist as they proceeded. A lot of magic you've been using today. When this is over, which it hopefully will be in, like, ten minutes, I'm going to buy you an entire buffet. Not a meal ticket to a buffet, but the whole thing. Kira's mouth began to water. That sounds great. As they prepared to enter the building, someone ran up behind them. It was Stephanie. Hey, she called. Sorry I wasn't here in time to help, but L.A. traffic did its thing, and I can't drive properly with, um, all this going on. She pointed vaguely at her face and moved her index finger around in a circle. Kira nodded. It's all right, Steph. I'm mostly drained, but give me a few minutes and we'll remove the curse. Pink spots, you say? Magenta, Stephanie corrected her. Like, purplish pink. Ugh, I'm starting to get used to the awful things. Moments later, they found the Trammells sitting on a bench in the terminal, with a railroad worker and a cop talking to them. None of the four saw the small group yet. Kira's brain was suddenly afire with worry bordering on panic. Without consulting her friends, she made a split-second decision and encased them all in a dome that blocked them from sight and hearing. Chris looked at her, and so did Steph. Chris asked, Did you just cast a spell? Stop, Kira said. I don't want my face plastered all over the news for this. I have an idea, though, and after we're done, we're heading to the nearest all-you-can-eat restaurant. Then we're banishing those magenta spots to oblivion. Though mildly skeptical, the others agreed. Catherine Trammell, meanwhile, sat listening to the police officer inform her that there was no sign of anyone in possession of a girl meeting their daughter's description so far. She stared blankly into space, holding her husband's hand and trying not to think about anything. Then light footsteps approached. Mom? Dad? A girl's voice shouted. Catherine exploded out of her seat, bowling aside the two men standing in front of her. Her heart felt like it was going to thump its way into her throat. She tried to say Jessica's name, but all that came out was a gasping sob as she fell to her knees and scooped the child up in her arms, clutching her close and crying. Aaron rushed to her side. Jessica! Oh, thank God, are you okay? Yes, the girl said. I'm fine. She seemed oddly aloof and confused, as though she were trying to remember something. Then she reached into her pocket pulled out a minuscule piece of what looked like plaster and placed it in her father's hand. Without thinking, he accepted it, and as the cop and the engineer came over to check on them and ask questions, he felt his mind go strangely blank. The policeman remarked, Good. Didn't you say you spoke to someone claiming to be a private detective? Do you have any information on them? Aaron was almost as overwhelmed with emotion as his wife was, but he had to attend to business. He turned to the officer, scratching his head. I don't remember, he admitted. I think someone offered to help look for her, but I was so upset and so much was going on that I'm blanking. I don't think so. Later that evening, he would find the card for McDonough investigation, and his memory would be jarred. The temporary mind wipe spell would fade. But for now, looking at his daughter and feeling a lump form in his throat, the most important thing was taken care of. His family could go on living. Kira allowed herself to relax as she stepped back into the house. She didn't want to be here again after the ugly scene she'd been forced to deal with while stopping Milena and the others. Also, police cars kept crawling around the neighborhood, so she'd had to be careful. But now that she was recharged and Stephanie's vision was cured of its neon confetti problem, there was one more thing to do. 
It had occurred to her during their massive lunch that the recent murders Leah had investigated, which had been performed according to sacrificial procedures in the book, were almost certainly the work of the orthodoxy. She had saved herself as well as the little girl from that fate. But the victims who hadn't been as lucky deserved justice. It was dusk, and though orange light still burned on the horizon, the half-destroyed house lay in deep gloom. Kira could barely see. By memory and touch, she worked her way up to the second floor. She found the closet she had opened while looking for Jessica, the one filled with boxes, including what appeared to be photo albums. Probably it was stuff left over from the original owners and had simply remained there when the orthodoxy had purchased the place, but maybe not. Kira took the box out and into the second-floor bathroom, where, much to her relief, there was a working light since having to conjure a light of her own would be annoying. Then she got to work. To her surprise, the albums turned out to contain pictures that looked familiar. One of the individuals depicted in them was a woman Kira had seen in the crime scene photos Leah had found. The former owner was one of Milena's victims, Kira wondered. She spent another hour combing the rest of the house and eventually turned up maps and personal dossiers on other people throughout the U.S., all of whom had been fatally mutilated with a razor blade, which meant their life forces had been stolen by the orthodoxy to work its malevolent will throughout America and the world. Kira sat on the floor, eyes closed, and allowed her mind to expand and intertwine with the residual pain lodged within the house and the items she'd found. She could not be sure, but she thought she had established a connection with the deceased, albeit a tenuous one. I don't know much about spirits of the dead or what thaumaturgy has to say about the afterlife, if there is one. But if there is anything left of these people's consciousness, I want them to know their loved ones will have justice. The world will find out what happened to them. I'm going to make all this stuff available. She opened her eyes and gathered the most important pieces of evidence. She wasn't certain if the police or one of the district attorneys would harass her for not sharing the information with them sooner. If that seemed likely, she would send the stuff to them anonymously. If not, though, it might help the agency to finally have a case they could say they had solved. And either way, the families of Milena's victims would no longer be tormented by uncertainty about the deaths of their parents, siblings, spouses, or children. It's a start, Kira told herself, and if nothing else, the horrible fact that this all happened might be what starts to unravel the orthodoxy once and for all. They won't get away with it again. Anezga was willing to admit to herself what she would never admit to anyone else in her coven. She had made mistakes. They should have pursued the council immediately after taking over the Lovecraft estate and devoted all available resources to killing them. They should not have worried about trying to impress the lesser covens throughout North America or trying to hold territory in the Northeast or anything except hunting down and killing their chief rivals, every last one of them, allowing nothing to get in the way of that all-important task. Anezga sensed that the rest of the orthodoxy knew it or was beginning to suspect as much. Given the setback they had just suffered, it was time for drastic measures, not only to bring them closer to victory, but to reaffirm who was in charge. The Grand Mistress mounted the stage, raised her arms, and splayed the fingers of her hands so her long black nails pointed in ten directions, seeming to encompass the whole auditorium. The crowd beneath her hushed. She had ordered all available personnel, everyone brought to America for the war, and any extra witches hanging around the regional offices, to congregate here in Knoxville, Tennessee, which was fairly close to the exact center of the eastern half of the United States. The only members of the coven excused from attendance were those running the bare minimum operations at the offices, as well as the token forces guarding New Orleans and Los Angeles. They had rented an assembly hall at the local university paying the money, and casting the spells necessary to ensure both comfort and privacy. Now, Anezka stood before a small army. Three-quarters of the coven was gathered before her, and that included the minority of their members who had remained in Moscow. Witches of the Orthodoxy, Anezka began, her voice augmented by magic so it echoed and reverberated without a microphone. 
that seem to thunder over the assemblage. Necessity dictates that we adopt a different approach to our conquest of the North American continent. Total war. She paused for dramatic effect, allowing the words to sink in as the eyes below her widened. Then she went on. Milena, a member of the senior table has been killed. Killed by the American upstart, Kira McDonough, with the near certain help of Pavla. Those two deliberately sabotaged our efforts to wipe out the American Council of Thaumaturgists. That means they are the Council's allies and will suffer the same fate. Not everyone had heard about Milena's death yet, and though no one was gauche enough to react openly, Anezga could tell that a few of them were shocked. The mere mention of Pavla made everyone appropriately wrathful since she was shaping up to be one of the worst traitors in the coven's history. This Kira, Anezga proceeded, though crude and untrained, possesses raw power far beyond what most casters have. She might have been a great asset to us, but she has scorned our friendship a dozen times. Therefore she must pay. This war ends when every member of the council, along with Pavla and Kira, lies dead, and I mean to end it within two months. Our dominion over this continent will be undeniable. There shall be no more hesitancy, no more half-measures. She outlined the rough strategy the orthodoxy would employ. The field army gathered here would march on New Orleans, either catching and destroying the council, even if it meant braving the dangers that might await them in the mysterious Bayou City. If they slipped away toward California, their soldiers would be positioned so the council could not flee to Mexico or Canada. Then, whether LeBlanc and her toadies were dead or not, the final maneuver would be against Los Angeles. By the time Inezga returned to the City of Angels, she intended that all their enemies would be reduced to piles of bones beneath her feet. There will be no distractions, she concluded. Any peripheral activities in this country are hereby suspended. Our operations in Eurasia are of secondary concern at best. All available resources shall be bent toward the single goal of total annihilation. Do you understand? The witches on the floor threw up their hands in allegiance, and Inezga smiled. Whatever frustrations they might have had would soon find excellent opportunities for vending. Yes, some of them would die in the fighting to come, but she had little doubt who would be the ultimate victor. Those of her troops who fell in battle would be honored for their bravery. Kira, Pavla, and LeBlanc would be wiped, not only from existence, but from memory. They would be destroyed so thoroughly that reality would regret having birthed them. Chapter 24 James woke up. He yawned, stretched, and swung his legs over the side of the bed, throwing off the covers in the same motion. Ugh, he groaned. I ought to have done that slower. He found his glasses on the nightstand, unfolded them, and put them on. Then he spent a moment examining and admiring the stately, old-fashioned but rather dilapidated bedroom in which he had been lodged. Ever since he had known Mother LeBlanc, He'd been curious about the native environment that had shaped her. They had missed out on visiting New Orleans during their cross-country trip to deal with the undisciplined casters unleashed by their book, but at last, they were here. Mary Mitchell sat in a chair near the door, reading a book. Tropical and Subtropical Gardening was the title. She looked up. James, how are you feeling? He rubbed his eyes. Better. Not perfect, but better than I have in quite some time. He looked down at his chest. Though he would have an impressive scar until the end of his days, it didn't look too bad from the outside. It was the internal damage that was still causing him lingering problems. He frowned and looked around. What time is it? Must be three or four in the afternoon. Mary chuckled. No, it's around ten in the morning. This region is a sauna. Crystal is nobly suffering through it, though. She is better equipped than anyone to do something about it. She's working on a spell that will replicate the effects of air conditioning since the house is not equipped with that particular luxury. Lame, James quipped. I support her in her endeavors. Frowning, Mary added, I only hope she doesn't accidentally kill any of the local plant life with a frost. The floor here is truly fascinating, though not adapted to winter weather, I'm afraid. Oh, 
LeBlanc wants to speak to you about something. There have been two important developments in our situation. James nodded and walked to the door, but stopped on the threshold. Oh, Mary? Thank you. I don't remember half of what's happened since they turned my house into an ashtray, and his voice trailed off since he didn't want to talk about Damien or Zakaria. And everything else. But I know you did what you could to keep me alive. I won't forget that. She nodded. You're welcome, James. I know you would do the same for me despite our minor disagreements during more peaceable times. James went into the kitchen, where someone had set up a small generator to power a coffee pot, a microwave, and a toaster. There was still a third of a pot of coffee left, and he poured himself a mug. At the table sat Mother LeBlanc and Azuto. James, still groggy, did not realize until he sat down that there was something resting on the surface between them, and it was not a thing to be dismissed. As he sipped the brew, his eyes fixed on it. A brass chalice with an inscription around the neck. It did not give off an obvious aura of power, yet something about it set off an alarm within his brain. It was paradoxical, but he knew he beheld an artifact of immense and sublime importance. It spoke to a part of him that comprehended things in childlike intuitive terms rather than anything the adult intellect could grasp. I take it, he began. That's the thing you mentioned wanting to dig up once we got to Nola? LeBlanc had been staring at the chalice, studying it, and Azuto likewise. She inclined her head. Of course. And it's good to see you're feeling better, James. If you're up to it, there are things you must know. Azuto said, I stumbled across one of the people from the Orthodoxy closing in on us, perhaps because I am not a full member. They did not detect me until it was too late, and I was able to drive them off. This was a day ago when I was farther north in the state, so our location remained secure. They probably knew we were headed to New Orleans anyway. So, while LeBlanc says we are safe for now, they will come after us soon. Correct, LeBlanc affirmed. The other thing you must know is that this object, she gestured at the ancient cup, might be what turns the tide in our favor. I hesitated to speak of it before, since it had been so long since I last saw it, that I needed to confirm its existence and location with my own two eyes. But as you can see, it is real. The Chalice of Old Jack. That was not his real name, but Old Jack will suffice. James wanted to make a wisecrack, but the odd feeling of superstitious awe was back. He held his tongue. I see. What, uh, does it do? LeBlanc flourished a hand and produced a muffin and a banana from within her dress. Here, eat something. She pushed them across the table. But yes, the chalice. I know roughly what its powers are, but I must be certain before we risk our future on its efficacy. We shall determine how it works tonight. If you feel well enough, you may participate. James took a bite of the muffin. Banana, which seemed redundant, given the fruit of the same type that LeBlanc had conjured to go with it, and washed it down with coffee. I'm in. I'm getting tired of not feeling well enough. You have to flex a weakened muscle for it to get stronger. Hell, Azuto is beating up orthodoxy goons now, and I've been in bed this whole time. Azuto shrugged. I did not beat anyone up, but thank you. LeBlanc stayed silent for another half a minute. So be it. Having everyone present would be best. And though we have time for you to finish recovering, I think time is running out. If we must leave Nola, the only place left to go is, James interrupted. Let me guess. Los Angeles. Kira had allowed her head to rest on Chris's shoulder. The sunset was beautiful. This was a great idea, she purred. Naturally, I feel guilty about sending poor Leah and Steph back to keep holding the fort while we extend our vacation, but, um, we deserve it. I needed to clear my head after all that. Notably, her thoughts had begun to turn gloomy as she dwelled on the necessity of killing Milena. 
If anyone deserved to die, it was probably her. But Kira found herself hoping for a time in which violence would no longer be needed. Chris wrapped an arm around her waist and drew her closer. That we do. The whole train ride was like being back at work again, in an especially busy week. Not fun. Oh, and I barely got to see the countryside since we were asleep during the best parts, or distracted by fighting those witches. Well, Kira extended her hand. At least California isn't lacking in scenery. Rather than go straight home, after they finished their business in Jeropa Valley and Riverside, Kira and Chris had rented a hotel room near the slopes of the San Bernardino Mountains before hiking up to a trail to a scenic overlook, just in time to watch the sun set over the valleys and sink into the Pacific Ocean beyond. It felt silly to take their weekend getaway so close to home. But it would make it easier to return to their homes and jobs. Thinking about what was to come, though, Kira felt like a dark cloud was settling over them. Chris, she said. I'm worried. We killed one of the Orthodoxy's most important people. And Pavla helped us do it. I thought they might forget about us and leave us alone, but they're probably going to treat this as siding against them in this stupid witch war they have going on with the council. Things might get dangerous. He nuzzled the top of her head. I'll do what I can. You know I'll stay by your side. She clenched her jaw and let out an exasperated sigh. I appreciate the thought, but that's not what I meant. I don't want you ending up as collateral damage. I think we need to talk about a standing order for you to get out of the way when things start to— Hey, he interjected, and there was an edge to his voice that surprised her. I thought we already agreed there wouldn't be any plans for me to shut out of anything. I signed up to be your partner come hell or high water, which means I have as much a stake in all this as you do. I helped with everything we dealt with these last few days, didn't I? Frowning, she retracted her head from his shoulder. Kinda, yeah. All I'm saying is that it doesn't do either of us any good if you get captured and used as leverage when I'm not there to protect you, or for you to jump into a situation you're not able to deal with and get hurt. I care about you, okay? I know you do, he replied. His tone was gentler, though she could sense his lingering annoyance. But if I'm going to trust you, you need to not underestimate me. I know I don't have magic. I defer to your judgment when it comes to that stuff and let you handle it. But I've pulled my own weight with all the other stuff so far. If things get rougher, I'll adapt to deal with it. We're in this together. Kira's gut roiled. You're goddamn stubborn, aren't you? Let's play it by ear. If I have to shove you into a closet and lock it to save your life, I will— no matter what you say or how much you complain later. But, well, yes, I appreciate your help. Most of the time. Don't do anything stupid, that's all I mean. I'll try, he replied. It wasn't much of a response, and she suspected they would have another version of this same argument again before long, possibly within the week. She embraced him. It's a nice evening. Starting to get dark and chilly, though. Want to head back to our room? Good idea, he agreed. If things do get worse, at least we'll have the memory of tonight, right? It's one of those perfect evenings we'll look back on years from now. If we're both still around years from now, Kira thought but did not say. Around and together. God, I hope so. Yes, she tugged on his belt. Let's go. This concludes... How to Be a Badass Detective 2 by Michael Anderley. Narrated by Dara Rosenberg. Copyright 2021 by Michael Anderley. This unabridged audiobook is published by arrangement with LMBPN LLC and was produced in the year 2021 by Tantor Media, Incorporated, a division of recorded books which holds the copyright thereto. Please visit Tantor.com for more information on our growing library of unabridged audiobooks.